and uh, and thank you everybody for taking the time out of your evenings to uh, to sit with us. Um, I I hope that uh, I hope the presentation will will go well, and I hope that we can get a lot of uh, a lot of your questions and comments and um, and hopefully answer a lot of them. So I'd like to just take a minute to introduce the other people from, from the town that are on. Uh, so I'm Allison Murray. I'm a principal planner in the planning department. We have Peter Hans, who is the director of the planning department. We have um, Howard. Howard, I don't know, you can raise your hand. There's Howard Barton, who's the assistant director of our Department of Environment and Waterways. Uh, we have Matt Collado, who's a planner in the planning department. We have uh, Councilwoman Lisa Inzarillo, who has joined us tonight. Lisa, can you wait? Um, we have, I know that I saw, uh, I saw Legislator Rob Trotta is here from the county. We also have, I see um, Dr. Egan from the Kings Park School District. So thank you for joining us. And, um, and representing our consultant H2M, we have Paul Cancilla with us. So thank you everybody again. Um, I am going to share my screen to start the presentation. And then once I do that, as Nicole had indicated, what we'd like to do is just go through the presentation first. It'll take probably about 20 minutes to go through the presentation. And then we're gonna open up to a questions and answer and, um, and comment period. So please, if there's something that comes to mind that you wanna ask a question about or you have a comment for, raise your hand and Nicole will, uh, once the presentation is over, we'll start calling through people in the order in which, uh, in which their hands were raised. Okay, everyone can see the presentation, correct? Correct. Great, thank you. Uh, so this is the fourth of, of six presentations that the town is doing to go over uh, the recommendations that have come out of the draft comprehensive plan. Now, this is an effort that many people know started about two years ago. We had uh, we had public outreach at that point, and um, and it's taken some time. We've gone through and drafting the plan, and it has finally been presented to the town board. That was the middle of December that it was presented to the board and the public, and we're taking the next. Uh, two months, month and a half to, to two months to go through with each of the communities what the recommendations that came out of the plan are. So the first question is, what is a comprehensive plan? A comprehensive plan is a document that has as its underlying purpose, the control of land uses for the benefit of the whole community. It's a plan that is required uh, by New York State town law for, for any township that, uh, that has zoning, they're required to have a comprehensive plan. Now, unfortunately, the town's last comprehensive plan uh, was adopted back between 1957 was one, 1961 uh, was the completion of it. So that's over 60 years old and, uh, and it, it fails to continue to, to reflect the the conditions of, of the town, how it's how it's grown over over the past 60 years. So the draft plan that we've prepared with H2M has a number of sections. It has a land use study, a circulation or transportation component, a community facilities plan, a sustainability plan, a capital improvement program, and uh, six community plans that that basically summarize the recommendations in the other sections of the plan uh, as they pertain to each of the individual communities. So the town has six, six communities and, um, and so we have six plans. This is a picture just to show people that are on the call um, what the town is considering the hamlet of Kings Park to be. Now we have different, uh, there are different school district boundaries and zip code boundaries. Um, so we adopted the, the census uh, boundaries for, uh, for noting Kings Park. So, you know, some people may think that, that the area, if you can see my cursor over here is part of Kings Park. Um, this area is part of, is Fort Salonga. 
Um, however, for the purpose of this plan, uh, this is the area that, that's considered to be Kings Park. Kings Park at a glance. Uh, for those of you that had attended the workshops, this information was, was available at that time, uh, but it's interesting to note some of the differences from Kings Park and, and the rest of Smithtown. Um, the, uh, the, the largest difference really is in terms of land use, Kings Park has by far the largest amount of open space out of any of the, any of the hamlets in the town. So Kings Park has approximately 30% of 33% of its acreage is dedicated to open space. That's largely the um, Sunken Meadow State Park and the Zaquag River State Park, um, but there's other parkland as well and preserved open space. So that's that's a valuable asset for, for the hamlet of Kings Park. Um, some other things to note is that in terms of commuting, um, Kings Park had the largest percentage of its population that actually commutes by, by rail. Mind you, that population, that percentage, I'm sure, has gone down significantly in the last year, but, um, but that's important for, for the town to take into consideration. This map here is, uh, is reflective of the, the community outreach that we had conducted. So back in 2019, the town had, as we had said, six community workshops. We also had an online questionnaire that was posted, was sent around to all of the community organizations. And we had asked the civics and the chambers to please you know, forward the, the links to this, um, to this questionnaire to all of its members. Uh, we sent the information for the public outreach to the school districts and um, and so forth. And so we got a significant amount of public input, which we were really happy with. We received over 1,200 responses to the online questionnaire. These blue dots that you see on the screen are all locations of people that um, that completed the questionnaire. We also had over 370 people that attended the various public workshops. The workshop for Kings Park was held in April of 2019. We had it at the Kings Park High School. This is a picture from the, uh, the beginning of, of the workshop. There were 110 people that attended the workshop, which was definitely one of our most highly attended workshops. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we also had about 100 people that were Kings Park residents that completed the questionnaire. Um, so Kings Park has really helped with the public uh, with the public outreach. So we appreciate that. And in addition to the outreach efforts conducted specifically for the comprehensive plan, there were other outreach efforts that um, that were in, have been incorporated into into this plan. Um, one is the local waterfront revitalization program. The town had drafted an update to our local waterfront program that was submitted to the state back in. Uh, in 2019, September of 2019, we had done public outreach at that point um, within the waterfront area. We also, and I have to thank uh, the Kings Park Civic and, and Chamber um, who, were, who were really helpful um, and, and truly organized a lot of the outreach for, um, for the downtown, the Kings Park downtown revitalization plan. There were a number of efforts that, that were underway and, um, and there was a tremendous amount of, of public input that was received as, uh, as that was drafted. Just to summarize some of the comments that we received at the Kings Park workshop, um, top priority for a lot of people was the downtown. Uh, wanting to know when sewers were going to be installed, uh, wanting to see improvements in pedestrian access and walkability um, from the neighborhoods as well as within the downtown, uh, the interest in creating additional civic space, the need for parking in the downtown, particularly in the west uh, end of the downtown, um, which has been somewhat uh, slightly alleviated, I think, hopefully, uh, with the, the opening of the parking lot on Pulaski Road. Um, uh, in terms of industrial uses, the, the request and comments that were received was to identify the existing uses and establish standards to be enforced. Um, this is largely with respect to the old Northport Road area. 
for parkland. Uh, there was a lot of support to encourage um, the acquisition of more parkland and creation of, of more trails, particularly well-lit trails. Uh, to maintain the former Kings Park Psychiatric Center as a park and create a park master plan and um, and also to upgrade Kings Park Memorial Park as well as as some other neighborhood parks in the area. Um, lastly, with respect to the environment, there was a strong emphasis on improving drinking and surface water quality uh, uh, requests to sewer San Remo for um, for water quality protection and also to encourage sustainable and green development throughout the, the town. So what I'll do right now, sorry, I'll move my cursor to the side, um, is just to go over some of the responses that we received as part of the online questionnaire. So these responses, the first couple of slides that you'll see have to do with um, responses townwide. So of those you know, 11 or you know, 1200 people that responded, what were uh, what were the numbers that um, you know that we got from that? And then the following slides will be answers uh, to, to people who lived within the hamlet of Kings Park. So townwide, the top five reasons that people live in the town of Smithtown. And uh, number one was the quality of schools. So Dr. Egan, thank you for that. Um, two was quality of life. Uh, finding a home that people liked, uh, being close to family and friends and character of the community and issues of concern, which are no surprise to, to people. Uh, top was obviously property taxes. Second was condition of parks and recreational facilities and then access to, to parks and recreational facilities as well. Uh, there was uh, strong support um, or concern for environmental quality and protection, traffic, and, uh, and bicycle and pedestrian safety. So this gives you just an idea of where people's concerns were. In terms of land use, the major comments that we received, it came across very loudly and clearly to keep single family residential neighborhoods as they are. Um, you saw on the last slide that uh, that the neighborhoods were one of the main reasons why people live here. They found a home that they like. They like the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhood, and so um, so the big comment there was was to keep the single family residential neighborhoods as as uh, two to encourage restaurants and retail, uh, agriculture where possible, commercial recreation offices and institutional uses. Uh, third, to discourage industrial uses to the extent that that's possible. Fourth, to improve biking and walking conditions. With respect to sustainability, people wanted to see things like planting more trees and providing incentives for businesses to, uh, to be more sustainable, go green. Um, Going on to the next, the uh, parks and open space comments, people were asked what kinds of facilities they, they wanted to see more of um, with respect to recreation and parks and open space. And the, the largest thing that people wanted, which we heard echoed in the, the workshops as well, was walking and hiking trails. Uh, natural areas and, and nature parks, paved bike trails. So people really looking for a way to, to keep an, an active lifestyle. Going into the Kings Park survey responses particularly, we had people um, trying to get an idea of how, of how much and, and how well people you know, utilize and take advantage of their, of their community and their downtown. Uh, great response in terms of you know, how, much, how many people that, that live in Kings Park, eat in Kings Park, restaurants, uh, shop at the retail stores. So 95% of people eat in the restaurants that are that are in the neighborhood, which is wonderful. You know, 73% that shop in the retail stores. Um, you know, and the numbers go down from there. So that shows you, you know, to some to the extent of, you know, what what is what does Kings Park have a lot of and what could it use more of? Uh, residents responded generally that they would like to see more restaurants and bars, uh, entertainment establishments uh, like movie um, theaters and so forth. Uh, microbreweries and distilleries, um, these are the smaller versions, uh, high-end retail stores and cultural facilities. How appealing would you find the following types of potential new development for downtown Kings Park? So I think this slide is 
um, hopefully somewhat self-explanatory, but I'll just summarize. Uh, the strongest support that we saw amongst the community was for one and two story buildings built close to the sidewalk. So this is in downtown Kings Park. Um, there was strong opposition for buildings that were higher than three stories. Uh, we also saw a lot of support to improve pedestrian access throughout the downtown, which I had, had said earlier, and create additional uh, community park and civic space. I'd like to I just put a, a slide in here for Nisquag River State Park because although this is a park that is the town does not have um, jurisdiction over, it was one of the, the most important aspects um, that people were discussing both in the uh, in the workshop and the online questionnaire. So the comments that we had received with respect to that were that everybody wanted or I should say mostly everybody um, wanted to see it maintained as a park. Um, other comments pertaining to it are the wishes to extend the hike and bike trail, um, which is well utilized to redevelop. Um, if there is redevelopment to redevelop for recreational, cultural and environmental purposes only. And lastly, to preserve your home. So just a few updates that I'm sure many of you, um, if not all, probably are, are aware of. But starting just within this past month, really, um, Nisiquag River State Park, or the uh, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation has just begun to undertake a master plan for Nisiquag River State Park. So the big ask that everyone had been asking for, for for so many years is finally coming to fruition. And, um, and I know that they've reached out to a lot of the civic associations and organizations, the chamber, um, they've reached out to, to Smithtown. I'm sure that they've all, I know that the county has been involved as well. Um, and we are trying to facilitate their, their development of the master plan as, as best as we can. Other updates about the park, the um, Marina Redevelopment Project is still um, is still on the table. Um, we had a discussion with State Parks and DEC a few weeks ago, and I know that they are um, they're revising their plans, um, but that is anticipated to move forward. And also, the New York State DEC Marine Division headquarters is is fully under construction there now. The recommendations that came out of the plan, um, the first few slides of the recommendations are going to go through the townwide recommendations and then we're going to get into Kings Park specifically. So for townwide, the, the large um, recommendations for land use are to modernize and simplify the, or the zoning ordinance to uh, generally write zone properties. So there are many properties throughout the town that um, that were, were zoned a specific zone to allow a particular use. However, um, those uh, the zones are not are not truly appropriate for for the area. So the idea is to um, is to right zone them, and um, and hopefully we can accomplish that. Uh, to reduce split zoning, which would reduce confusion about what uses are permitted where to maintain existing neighborhoods. You saw the, uh, the, the primary takeaway from the survey was to keep neighborhoods as is. So the, the plan was created with the intention of, of accomplishing that. To reduce incompatible uses, which also goes along with maintaining existing neighborhoods. Um, for the downtowns to create revitalization and transit-oriented development. That's in the three, uh, the three traditional downtowns, Kings Park, Smithtown, and St. James. There's the creation of uh, two new zoning districts. These don't really affect Kings Park, they're in Nesconset, but we have it in here just as a, a town-wide recommendations, the, the commercial corridor zone and the Nesconset core zone. Um, recommendation to expand uses that are permitted in what was formerly known as the Hop Hop Industrial Park and now has been renamed as the Long Island Innovation Park at Hop Hop. Um, and also to differentiate zoning between West Jericho Turnpike and Middle Country Road. So for those of you that, that travel along the roadway, uh, both West Jericho and Middle Country Road have the same zoning right now, even though their uses are, are somewhat different. So, um, so the plan sets forth to, to differentiate that zoning to separate the, those two different areas. For transportation, 
the plan recommends number one, enhancing pedestrian accessibility near transit centers, uh, the downtown and the Hopwalk Industrial Park, also creating traffic calming in, in areas where there's um, excessive speeding to fill gaps in the bicycle network, work with DOT and Seva County DPW to deploy time signal progression. Um, that's with the, the goal of reducing um, congestion on the streets to consider complete street strategies and commercial and mixed use development areas, which would incorporate uh, biking, uh, pedestrians and, and motorists all, um, all in a safe manner. To lastly, to continue to work with DOT, so that's New York State DOT, County DPW and the MTA to reduce congestion and improve rail service. Recommendations that pertain townwide for community facilities, generally upgrade existing facilities. Uh, two, to acquire additional open space uh, and, and to that end, consider establishing an open space fund. Uh, three, uh, recreation community center and to protect historic resources. So these were all, um, these were all found, they were important you know, from the community and, um, and are reflected in the plan. The recommendations as they pertain to Kings Park. So I'm going to start by saying it gets a little bit confusing here. We actually have two plans that pertain to downtown Kings Park. Uh, we have the comprehensive plan, which we're talking about now and is underway. We also have the Kings Park downtown revitalization plan. And that plan is going along in a, in a parallel track to this. Um, the recommendations from that plan are incorporated into the comprehensive plan. So what you see in front of you is actually the recommendations from the Kings Park downtown master plan as incorporated into the comprehensive plan. And the recommendation is to replace the central business zoning that exists throughout the entire downtown now to replace it with three zones, a, a downtown core area, which would go from um, basically from the boulevard to from Kings Park Boulevard to Pulaski Road, a, a transition zone, which would be two, two areas from Pulaski Road um, west and then from, uh, from the boulevard east to approximately Paddock East Street. And the third zone is a transit-oriented development zone, which would be the shopping center on Indian Head Road and, uh, and the properties along Meadow Road West that back up to the railroad. Uh, the last part of this recommendation is that the, uh, the properties along Pulaski Road that are currently zoned CB, the recommendation would be to rezone them from commercial business to neighborhood business. These next two slides go over um, in a little more detail the recommendations and, uh, and, and dimensional requirements that, um, that the new zones would have. So for the core area, which I had said is from, uh, from the boulevard to Pulaski Road, it would allow a slight increase in the maximum height of buildings. So currently uh, buildings are only allowed to be two and a half stories high or 35 feet. It would allow them to increase the height to, uh, to three stories high and, and 40 feet. So an additional five feet in height. Um, it would also allow uh, properties to reduce the rear yard setback, which is currently set at 50 feet, a minimum of 50 feet to 10 feet, uh, except for those properties that are adjacent to residence districts. Those would still have to maintain the, the 50 foot minimum. Um, in the transition area, so these are the two areas at the east and the west end of the business district. The intention there is to reduce the overall density of, of those zones and to truly allow them to serve as a transition from the, the core of the downtown to the uh, residence districts beyond. So in order to accomplish that, there's a recommendation to increase the minimum lot area for those properties from 5,000 square feet to 7,500 square feet uh, to also increase the minimum lot width um, it would also, it would maintain the existing height restriction. So this area, you would not see that, that increased five feet. It would maintain the two and a half stories or 35 foot height requirement. 
It does allow uh, for, for a reduction in the, um, in the rear yard setback, but again, that reduction would not take place anywhere that they were adjacent to a residence district. So I think in most of those locations, you're gonna see that the 50 foot rear yard setback would be maintained. For the transit oriented development area, this is the area that, um, that encompasses the shopping center on Indian Head Road, as well as Meadow Road West. The maximum height uh, would also, you can see here, it currently is two and a half stories or 35 feet. Uh, this would allow the maximum height um, to go up to 40 feet uh, and still maintaining the two and a half stories in areas where it's adjacent to a residence district. In areas uh, that are not adjacent to the residence district, so they're closer to the, to the railroad, um, it would allow a maximum height of three stories and up to 50 feet for, for mixed use development. Now, in order to accomplish any of those uh, major improvements, I think just about everybody on the call knows, um, you need sewers. And the town is, um, the town is not the, the one that is in charge of, of the sewer project. It's actually Suffolk County that is, um, that's in charge of the sewer project. But we just wanted to give an outline and status um, uh, on where we are with respect to sewers. So next week, when is February 2nd? Two weeks. Um, Suffolk County will be holding a public hearing with respect to the um, to the district's fee structure. Uh, so this will this will affect the um, the existing uh, sewer district more than than anything else. Um, but that's that's one opportunity for people who are interested. Uh, you can you can find out and maybe legislator Trotter knows how people can um, can listen in to the public hearing or participate in it. Uh, if all goes according to plan, then the county anticipates going out to bid and starting construction in 2021. So at some point this year, they would be able to start construction uh, with anticipated completion in the fall of 2024. So the boundary line that you see here is the uh, is the proposed sewer expansion area. So anything that's within this red um, this red shaded area is where is what would would get sewered. Next area um, of change or potential change in the Kings Park area is we'll refer to as the Jeswali area, Raleigh Farm. Um, it's the basically the intersection of Old Northport Road and, and Lawrence. Um, and this property, many people will know it well. Uh, we have an aerial photo of it uh, over here for people to look at. Uh, some of it is undisturbed. Some of it was um, was mined and, and filled. There's a partial uh, capped landfill over here. You've got totally undisturbed virgin land um, to the north of it, and you have Raleigh Farm to, um, to the west. So the recommendation for this area is to rezone it from R21, which is half acre residential zoning, and light industrial zoning. So the, the southern portion of, of this area is zoned light industrial. Uh, recommendation is to change the, that zoning for that whole area to medium density residential development and to remediate the mined and filled portion of the property. The recommendation is also, sorry, um, to cluster the development so that you can preserve the open space that um, an undeveloped land that, that's up in the north, which is adjacent, it's directly adjacent to the DEC unique area. So it could create a really large um, natural corridor. Going to the old Northport Road area, we split it up into two sections. Um, one is the east section of old Northport Road, which you see here, this is east of the, um, uh, east of Sunken Meadow Parkway. So there are recent developments over the past five or, or six years um, that have begun to change the character of this portion of the road from, from quite an industrial uh, zone to, to somewhat more of a 
community facility, still industrial, um, but somewhat more of a community facility area. So you have the solar farm, uh, Kings Park Solar, that's at the corner of Old Northport and Indian Head Road over here. And then Prospect Sports, which is still, it's under construction, um, but is, uh, is anticipated to move forward. So with those kinds of uses, uh, the town sees that there's, um, there's a potential to, to rezone part of this as, uh, as community facility and to continue um, similar types of uses in, in this part of Old Northport Road. Going to the, um, the west side, uh, west of the parkway, the town, uh, the plan has a recommendation to rezone the heavy industry, sorry, the heavy industry area um, that you see in yellow here from LI to HI. You'll see that there's an asterisk there that I'm, I'm going to get to um, in a minute. We had a significant discussion with the COMAC community. Um, last week we had our meeting with COMAC. So there was significant discussion about, um, about changing this area to HI and, and, and a lot of opposition uh, to that, you know, it being seen as, as legalizing uses that, um, that had existed uh, illegally for, for quite some time. So Nicole Gargiulo had offered at that time, and I know the supervisor has taken her up on it, uh, the supervisor does plan, if he hasn't already scheduled the meetings yet, um, to meet with the community associations uh, to, to discuss the recommendations of this area. So although the draft plan recommended changing it to heavy industry, um, we, we don't see that being the final recommendation that, um, that, goes, that goes forward into the final plan. So um, I know there's going to be a lot of of discussion about that. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be there's people on the call that want to talk about this tonight. But just to let you know that, um, that the town has heard the objections and, um, and is supportive of, of the public and, and wants to, to work through to come up with a, a solution for that. Um, Going on to the next bullet, uh, recommendation is to prohibit residential uses west of the parkway. So currently, if you can see my cursor, um, this entire area is zoned, uh, is zoned residential. However, it's in a pocket of industry and, and allowing uh, single family residential homes in this area uh, would, would benefit, nobody would benefit, not the, the residents who would live there. Um, the industry, it, it's, it just is not, is not proper zoning for that area. So uh, the plan does not recommend what this area particularly should be zoned, but just that residential uses um, should not be permitted in the town and should, should consider what, um, what the zone for this area should be. One of the other recommendations is to permit non-solid uh, waste transfer stations um, in, the, in the heavy industry zone as a town board special exception. So that means that it's not something that is automatically a permitted use. It is a use that is permitted if it meets particular uh, requirements that are set forth um, in the zoning ordinance. So any kind of an amendment like that uh, would also would need further environmental review and, and public input. Um, just letting, letting people know that at, at this time. Um, so it's a, basically, it's a recommendation for the town to consider it. Um, uh, echoing what was said on, on the other side of Old North Port Road, a recommendation to consider rezoning part of the corridor to community facilities. Um, many people know that there was, was talk about uh, allowing indoor organic waste processing or, or indoor composting um, in, in some locations around the town. The, uh, the Old Northport Road area is one of the areas that um, that, that might be suitable for. So I don't, the town board would not be changing the zoning unless uh, unless an application you know, had come in that met the, the requirements. And I'll also say that the town conducted a separate review for um, a separate study for indoor organic waste processing. That study has been completed. There is a draft um, ordinance amendment that has been proposed to the town board and the town is currently doing a separate environmental impact statement. So we're still in the process of reviewing 
um, of reviewing that that has not even hasn't gotten to the point the uh, the draft environmental impact statement hasn't even gotten to the point where we can where we can open up for for public comment but there would certainly be opportunity for public comment uh, for that as well. Allison, yes. I just have a question in the chat. Uh, do you mind just kind of ex kind of like t discussing the historic, uh, um, what basically what's what's gone on over the course of the last I think three or four decades over there? The question is really, uh, do you mind clarifying changing heavy industry so illegal uses that are currently happening can now become legal uses? I, I if you can just kind of explain the the history there so so the residents sure. listening in know sure um and i might uh i might have pete jump in on this as well but um the uses that are there when i say that they're not legal um many of the uses don't conform to to the town's zoning ordinance so the the light industrial zoning is really intended for um for something like a large office building warehousing um uh, a lot of what you see in the industrial park, most of the industrial park is, is zoned light industry. A lot of the uses that you see along Town Line and Old Northport Road are, are outdoor storage, they're sand mining. Um, they are uses that uh, many of them have approvals from New York State DEC uh, to operate. However, they're operating not in conformance with um, with the town. So although the town has issued um, violations to them and they know that they are in violation, uh, they have DEC permits, which makes it somewhat more difficult um, to, to navigate. I can, I can, if we wanna, I only have like one more slide left. So if you wanna take a minute now and maybe either Howard or, or Pete can expand upon that just while we're on this slide. Anymore? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we, um, the area does have a lot of uh, non-conforming uses. Um, it's not something that's happened overnight. Um, there is enforcement um, with the town. Um, a lot of it has been chalked up as the cost of doing business, but um, this is the area of the town that we basically been trying to compress to this area. Uh, west of the parkway. We've been pushing as much as possible to clean up uh, uh, east of the uh, parkway, as you had mentioned, with the solar farm, the, um, um, the town's facilities with uh, Flynn Park, um, as well as Prospect Sports. And we also had mentioned the other part of North Northport Road, where, uh, where it's by the Jiswali properties. Um, that, that area as well is substantially cleaner from what it was 10 years ago. Um, we continue to monitor this area. Um, we worked well with uh, the Farino brothers on uh, trying to clean up that property where they have a car storage area. Um, and um, there's more work to do. As you can see from this map, you'll see areas that are listed as R43, which is single family residential. Um, one of the recommendations is to remove residential from that area. Um, it's just not appropriate to have uh, any dwellings um, west of that parkway, given what's going on. Um, as uh, Allison alluded to, um, we continue to um, enforce uh, zoning in the area. Um, we've been working with uh, several property owners uh, to basically try to clear up as many of the uh, aesthetic uh, issues as possible, as well as uh, grading and drainage. Um, as you know, there, if you go down that road, um, during stormy times, there's a lot of uh, uh, drainage issues where the property, uh, the water's flowing from the sites out into the roadways. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. And, um, you know, we're working on the master plan to, uh, to improve this area. And I just was, oh, go ahead, Pete, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, you know, there was uh, <clears throat> questions about what does it mean by HI? Um, again, as Allison said, uh, it was loud and clear. Um, we don't want to uh, award people that have been violating uh, the zoning for years. Um, there's a need for these kind of areas. I mean, this, uh, 
the town, a lot of the residential homes, uh, you know, they have landscapers, there's uh, asphalt companies, concrete. These are all services that are needed um, in our town and uh, we need to have a place for it. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to uh, reward people that are violating the ordinance. Um, so even though there was a proposal or a, a recommendation to um, switch from LI to HI, it's not very likely that there's support for that. Um, yeah, I'll kick it over to you, Howard. Well, I was just gonna say that to build on what uh, you were talking about with enforcement actions, ultimately the town does not have the final authority on that, that goes to the courts. And the courts have historically taken the position that any of these properties that have a state DEC permit, once the, the property owner or the business presents that in court, we get thrown right out. So that's been an enforcement uh, nightmare for years where the state by issuing their permits basically undercuts the town zoning and we have very limited ability to really enforce fines and enforce land use because the courts throw us out. Thank you both, um, appreciate that. I'm gonna continue, I think we've got two more slides left and then we can open it up to, uh, to questions and answers. Some of the additional recommendations um, that are not necessarily land use related, more community facilities and recreation, um, recommendation to work with the Long Island Greenbelt Trail Conference. They're the ones that are, um, that are responsible for maintaining and operating the Greenbelt Trail. Uh, but to work with them to eliminate um, or shorten, sorry, I didn't say short head, shorten trail gaps, uh, to consider extending the Kings Park hike and bike trail, both to the Nisiquag River and the Long Island Greenbelt Trail, and also to the DEC Kings Park unique area uh, that's on the south side of, of Meadow Road, uh, to upgrade Kings Park Memorial Park to conduct a gaps analysis of sidewalk and bicycle infrastructure um, to think, well, gaps or gaps, just to see where we can fill those gaps in to, to create a, um, a more usable network. Also to encourage local farmers market to, um, to return to Kings Park as well as to other, um, other locations throughout the town to consider implementing a green business program in the downtowns and um, for Kings Park in particular to complete an erosion study um, and uh, mm -hmm. management plan at the Kings Park Bluff, which anybody that, that's familiar, which I assume that everybody has, has used the bluff, you know the, um, the issues that the town has with erosion there. And uh, it's not a straightforward answer so um, so it's it's important to take a look at it to study what the, the forces in effect are and um, and how that can be how that can be addressed. The, oh, there we go. Next steps. Um, so here we are two years basically into the process. The first six months or so was spent doing public outreach um, actually towards the end of, of 2019 as well. Uh, much of 2020 was spent drafting the plan, uh, lots of meetings between the consultant and the, um, and the town. And we're finally at the point where we're able to present the, the draft to the town board in the middle of December and are having our community outreach meetings now. Um, I'm going to give this over to Howard in a minute so that he can, can explain what the CEQA process is. But the, the State Environmental Quality Review um, also began at the, uh, at the December meeting. Being how large of a, of a document this is and, and potential for, uh, for impacts, both, both positive and we hope only positive, but, um, but the potential for other impacts, uh, it has to go through the environmental review process. So that has begun um, and there are opportunities for public input with that too. So I'd like it, Howard, can you, can you just explain what the CEQA process is, where we are in it and, um, and moving forward? Sure, uh, the CEQA process, it's the State Environmental Quality Review Act. And that is uh, state law that 
any project that may have a significant adverse impact on the environment needs to go through an environmental impact statement. Uh, out of an abundance of caution, um, we are basically taking the position that there may be some unforeseen adverse impacts, so we are going through the full CEQA process. Uh, that starts off with the town board back in December issuing a CEQA positive declaration, a determination of significance, and that an environmental impact statement will be required. With that, uh, the town issued a draft scoping document, which is basically the issues to be looked at in the environmental impact statement and the extent of the analysis to be done. That is a public document. It's available on, uh, on the town's website now for public comment, uh, for the public to identify any issues that are not already covered in the, the draft scope. We'll take those comments and include them in the final scope, which will be the basis for the draft generic environmental impact statement. We anticipate preparation of that running through uh, the latter rest of this month, February into early March. And if all goes according to the schedule, I believe that would be looking to accept that in March. Uh, once the impact statement is accepted, there's a public comment period on that, minimum 30 days, very possibly longer. Um, and at that point, all of those comments are taken and a final environmental impact statement is prepared addressing those comments looking at uh, potentially alternatives to what we had thought of, what others have suggested. And once the final environmental impact statement is accepted, that there will again be a public comment period on that. And I believe then that the final um, plan will be modified or any changes that you feel are necessary coming out of the impact statement process. So we kind of have two parallel paths right now, the DEIS, as well as the draft plan, public comments on one or the other may ultimately result in revisions to both the final EIS and the final plan. And that pretty much, I believe covers it, unless uh, you notice know, anything I missed, Allison. No, no that's great. Um, so, if people have comments on either the plan or the CEQA process, we just wanted to, to put a slide up here so that um, there was information on how you could, how you could provide those comments. Uh, as far as the draft comprehensive plan goes, you can attend any of the virtual meetings that we have going on. So even, you know, if you know people that were unable to attend this meeting or a meeting for their particular Hamlet, uh, they're welcome to attend any of the meetings that we're having. We have two more meetings, uh, one next Thursday, and the, the last one will be will be in two Thursdays. So uh, please let people know that. Uh, we're accepting written comments. They can be sent either by email to smithtownplanning at smithtownny.gov. They can also be sent by mail. You can address them to the planning department um, at, at Town Hall, which is 99 West Main Street in Smithtown. You can, uh, if you don't wanna do that or you wanna do that and you wanna uh, comment also at the public hearing, the town board will be holding a public hearing uh, on the draft plan, uh, likely at the end of February. And we don't have a date that's been determined yet, but that will, that will be published in the newspapers. Um, It'll, uh, I think they have to, pub for a hearing, it has to be published, I think, for, for two weeks. Um, so it'll certainly be in, in the newspapers. It'll be on our website. You can keep on, on checking back and we're gonna, we'll try and get the information out as well um, once that date has been scheduled. Lastly, at the very end of the process, there is an additional public hearing for the adoption of the final comprehensive plan. So if you believe that there are comments that were given uh, for, at the draft stage that were not adequately addressed um, in, in the final plan. You have 
uh, you can absolutely go to the town board and let the town board know at that point that um, that the comments that uh, that you had, you know, were not adequately addressed and that they should not um, adopt the plan at that point or that you feel that they were adequately addressed um, and and are happy moving forward. So so there's a lot of public um, there's a lot of public participation in in this aspect. You know, the next few months are are going to be very um, public input driven. Uh, and as far as CEQA goes, as Howard has explained, currently the draft scoping document is open for public review and comment until tomorrow. I think at 5 p.m. is when the comments have to be submitted. Um, uh, Howard, can you just let people know if they have comments with respect to the scope, who it should be, uh, who it should be directed to? I believe it, it goes to David. Yes. Um, and at the it, at the DEW. Uh, main address okay. dew at smithtownny.gov okay. great and if for whatever reason if we get the comments and they're not sent to dew we are forwarding all comments to the department of environment and waterways anyway so if, don't be concerned about you know whether you might have sent it to the incorrect department we're we're sharing all comments between both departments um, and then as Howard had said, there will also be a review and comment um, period of at least 30 days, um, quite possibly longer once the draft uh, environmental impact statement has been accepted by the board. So there'll be significant opportunity to review, to review that. Um, and, uh, and at this point, I am going to say thank you to everybody for listening to the presentation, which went longer than the 20 minutes, but, um, but I hope it was helpful. And, uh, and I'll turn it over to Nicole to, um, to take questions. I'll also, I'll stop my screen share so that we can see everybody. Uh, okay, great. So we have, we have two uh, folks with their hands up. Uh, again, if, if you are having trouble using the raise hand function or find it, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, Okay, I see Whitney O'Donnell with his hand up literally. I will get to you, sir, I promise. <laughs> uh, and if you are looking to use the button, it's a smiley face. Smiley face. Uh, again, if everybody can keep their smoke. Uh, so there's no echo. Uh, I, I promise I'll ask you to unmute as soon as it's, uh, as soon as I, I call out each, each of your names. Uh, again, the smiley face with the plus sign is on the bottom right to the screen. And if you click that button, your raise hand will uh, just hit the raise hand button. Uh, we're we're going to start with uh, Legislator Trotta, and then uh, I have two folks um, up with their hands up, and then I will call uh, Mr. Whitney shortly after that. Uh, go ahead, Legislator Trotta. A couple things. I just want to touch briefly on the um, sewer rate increase. Not everyone is affected by it, so I'll keep it quick. If you're in the sewer district now, you're probably going to get, they want to raise your rates 500%. Um, I have a website set up, a Facebook page called Kings Park Sewers. You'll be getting a letter in the mail next week. There's a public hearing February 2nd at 2, 2, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You can Zoom on. I want as many people as possible. Uh, this has to do with the $250 million sewer stabilization fund that was recently rated. Uh, it was designed so that your rates only go up 3%, not 500%. So we'll skip slightly. And then there was some confusion um, with reference to a rail spur that was in conceptual planning uh, because we face a huge, huge garbage problem coming down the road. Once the Brookhaven Town landfill closes, we are gonna have to ship ash somewhere else off Long Island. Our rates will go through the roof and there was some discussion about putting a rail, a rail spur somewhere where we can remove the ash out. Somehow that was conjectured into, I'm, I'm proposing a rail spur, I'm not, that we're going to take New York City's garbage, which is blatantly, absurdly a lie. So things need to be controlled, what's said, and rumors and innuendo can only hurt this community. I mean, I think that area that we talked about down by the industrial area, some of it has to be rezoned. And um, how it's correct, the, the courts have found, when I was in 10th grade riding my dirt bike, that's when that was being, that, that, that land that was zoned residential, I watched it get sand mined and then filled in 
with almost essentially garbage. You know, well, the I'm construction. Showing your age. I'm starting to what? You're showing your age. Yeah. Okay. So that land is, is can't be residential and it should be used for something commercial. Now, if you look at that, an aerial view of it, it's actually the perfect spot. You have the parkway on one side, you have the rail tracks on the other side, you have Pulaski, um, a town line road with the incinerator right there, and you have a relatively big gap now uh, going with a car dealership, so, where the car storage area is. So if you're ever going to do anything that's not going to affect anybody, that's the spot. And I think Peter hit, hit the nail on the head. Every community needs an industrial area. Where do you think you know, the, the landscapers go, the construction people go? That they need something like that. And, and, and I think the community is actually lucky to have a spot that's so secluded. You know, you can, everything can't be an NIMBY. You can't do that. It just can't be like that. You ha people have to give. You know, I'm not saying, you know, in a million years, I wouldn't be taking New York City's garbage. It's just, that's just silliness. So I think people need to keep an open mind. I think people need to realize something has to be done because our garbage will be, instead of $400 a year, it will be $5,000 a year. And make no mistake about it. I look at the, I, I at the reports coming down the road and Peter will back me up on this. It's a disaster waiting to happen. So we need to keep an open mind and we need to look at every available option, whether it be a rail spur there or somewhere to get. If you put a rail spur in that just took out the ash and some of the debris, whatever it might be, you're taking trucks off the road and out of our community, driving past, you know, Comac High School and the elementary school on Town Light Road and Indian Head Road. So it can benefit us. And the town has the ability to limit anything coming in. So again, this is in the preliminary stages and I think that everyone should keep an open mind. So thank you. Uh, Howard, I, I remember having this conversation a while back when Russ was, uh, was still the director of DEW. There's actually a, a large group of environmental experts that meet on a regular basis. I believe, I don't know if it's monthly or if they're doing it via Zoom anymore, but this is something that's being talked about by environmental experts as something to plan and prepare for. And they are looking at all different types of options too, correct? Yes, there are a couple of um, expert groups, uh, waste management experts primarily that are looking at what's going to happen in a few years when Brookhaven landfill uh, closes. Uh, that's the only place you can legally take ash on Long Island. So it's going to have to go somewhere else. And um, if you, as uh, legislator Trotta said, you have to ship it somehow. It's either truck or rail and the truck traffic is not really the, the way to go. Rail has its issues, uh, primarily uh, ones of service times. You know, with it's such a, com a commuter based railroad, you have to plan it carefully, but the rails have a system in place to handle that. And it's looking like uh, the best option for getting waste off Long Island. And just, uh, just to point out, every town is looking at it. Babylon's looking at it, Islip's looking at it, Brookhaven's looking at it. It's a problem island wide. So it's not like Smithtown's gonna take everyone's ash, not true. You know, each town is going to have to do something. Yes, and um, the ash that we are currently generating with our own garbage is right across Town Line Road. It's the uh, Covanta plant. So you'd, you would cut down on the truck traffic that currently runs through Smithtown to get out to Yapank in Brookhaven. Were you to load it on rail right across the street from uh, Covanta, not only are you avoiding the truck traffic going off Long Island, you're avoiding the truck traffic that currently exists, taking it to Brookhaven. Thank you, Howard. Um, okay, so so Kristen's had her hand up, I think, for about an hour. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let her uh, go ahead and unmute herself. Give her a second. We can, you should be unmuted now, Kristen. Thank you. Go ahead. You can hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, so I had a question about building height on pages 254 and 255 of the document. 
So if you look at downtown core, it says that the maximum height will be three stories or 40 feet, which is confusing to me because 40 feet would be four stories. And then downtown transition would be two and a half stories or 35 feet. Again, 35 feet would be three and a half stories. And then most concerning of all is on page 255, where it talks about the downtown TOD zoning, building height allowing two and a half stories or 40 feet. Um, two and a half stories at 40 feet would be 20, 20 feet tall ceilings on two floors. So I'm just questioning the, the height restrictions there. Yeah, uh, I can answer some of that. I mean, that that's assuming you have a square box type building and it sounds like you're using a 10 foot, um, you know, from floor to ceiling height. But currently uh, most of our uh, districts in town have a two and a half uh, story or 35 foot uh, maximum height. Um, a lot of buildings don't even get near the maximum height, but that uh, allow that encompasses things such as parapets. Uh, you might have a pitched roof, um, so you could have a two-story building that's maybe 22 feet from uh, you know for the first and second floor. But if you have a um, a pitched roof, you may need that additional height, but not necessarily have a story under that. Um, so for the downtowns, uh, uh, I, the the core area. They were talking about an increase for a maximum uh, number of stories to three, but increasing the height instead of uh, being 35 feet, they were allowing an additional five feet for a maximum height of 40 feet. Again, uh, a lot of buildings don't normally get to that height, um, but it's allowing a little bit more flexibility for uh, some design of buildings if they choose to uh, do upgrades uh, along Main Street. Um, we were using uh, standard numbers uh, for a lot of the traditional downtowns um, that people wanted. People talked about having a Northport, Port Jeff or Huntington type uh, architecture for our downtown. And uh, those are typical of the numbers that were used in those communities. So you're talking about that the 40 feet could be used as say like a facade, um, one of those fake height type architectural features? Possibly, but uh, I mean, any any uh, site plan for a commercial review is subject to approval by the Board of Site Plan Review. Um, and it's not typical that we get a lot of dummy fronts like that, where you would have a, a, a 20 foot high building and then a 10 foot uh, uh, Dodge City uh, type uh, facade on top of it. Um, but again, it's, it's also attic areas and uh, peaked roofs, um, elevator shafts, things like that. Again, though, um, you know, 40 feet at two and a half stories just seems like quite a lot of, of space that you're giving them. You know, it's, 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 it's one thing to have a two and a half story building in, right. you know, say the transition zone. And I did have a question about that transition zone in the west end of town as well. If I can ask that now, or should I wait for a public comment period? No, no, you can ask that. Go now. ahead. Oh, okay, okay. So the transition zone limits um, building heights to two and a half stories or 35 feet. Which so, is what, essentially keeping it what it is now. That's uh, the current uh, zoning requirement for that area. So there's okay, no but, changes proposed. Right, but on the West End, interestingly, that transition zone allows for core, core development, which is three stories or 40 feet, it allows for transit-oriented development, TOD, and transition. Now, TOD is, is that two and a half stories, that's 40 feet. So my contention is on that west end of town in the transition zone, I'm opposed to allowing you know, any three-story or transit-oriented development um, mixed in there. Again, west of Pulaski Road. You know, interestingly, my initial... Um, understanding was that the, that the sewer was only, the sewers were only gonna to go to Pulaski Road. That, those, that was in earlier plans. And then more recently, it's, it's extended down to Park Avenue. I don't have a problem with it going down to Park Avenue, but that area, just so you know, is, I, of course, you know, it's very low, it's quiet. It's mostly residential area with quiet little neighborhoods back there. 
So by making that a, a transition area that, that also allows for core and transit oriented development, I don't, I don't see how that would work there. I mean, it, the cars come speeding into town there, you know, so fast. If, if you, you know, spend some time there, it's, 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 you know, it's a transition zone, but it looks like what you're allowing this plan is also core and transit oriented development, which is supposed to be done by the train station. Right, so I think um, it, it might be worth, I had to take a look at, at the map and maybe maybe clarification um, of the map is called for, um, but the zones do not overlap. So the transition zone goes from Park to Pulaski, mm -hmm. then the core uh, zone goes from Pulaski uh, and then along Main Street to, um, to the boulevard. May I interrupt? Um, because if you look at the, the note on that transition oh, so zone. Are you able to pull up the map? What's that? Are you able to pull up the map out? Yeah, and I might, I think I might pull up the map from the, let me see if I can get it from the, um, I have the one from the presentation, but uh, I also have the one from the Kings Park plan itself. So let me just see what. Okay, because, because on intent, that. Yeah, the intent of transition is to keep it as is. It's obviously, that's not where we want the, um, the more dense uh, development. We only want that in the core where nobody's impacted, uh, basically in close proximity to the train station area where the Petro fuel site is um, next to the railroad station. But transition is supposed to be just that, a transition um, between the residential and the core. And I agree with that. And I 100% yeah. believe that I, is the way it should be, and, you know, left the way it yeah. is. Um, but if yeah, you look I at, think at what the map um, says, it says, yeah, it rezoned for three sub-districts, transition, so it's, core, right. and TOD. Yeah. Right. So, right. So this is the TOD right here. Um, the transition zone are the, the uh, diagonal um, hatching, which is from uh, Park to Pulaski. Right. If you look at your little dialogue yep. uh, box there, it looks like it's pointing right to the transition zone there, that the transition zone should allow core and Ah, uh, I see. It, yeah. Um, no, thanks, a thank you for pointing that out. It's a that label, um, that label pertained to the to the entire area, saying that there were there were three sub districts, but not that there were three sub districts. So it's um, but we can we move that can move that label. Uh, yeah. The label, the label did not pertain um, just to that uh, particular area. It was it was to the entire downtown. But I think what we can then do is is change it to show. Um, uh, transition area here, core area here, uh, TOD area here. Right, because you have rezone as a neighborhood business for yeah, Pulaski no, pointing right there. So, yeah. all right, so what you're saying is that in that transition zone, it will only be basically what it is now, which is two and a half stories. Yes. Correct. Okay. And then, uh, and, and then, and then Peter, just, I, I would just like it further clarified at some point that two and a half stories you know, I, I understand what you're saying, um, I, but I'm, I'm still having trouble conceptualizing how two and a half stories could possibly be 40 feet in the uh, TOD zoning. It's not likely that it is, and it's not typical, but uh, you, I mean, it sounds like, you, you know, you're assuming uh, a ceiling height of about 10 feet. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have buildings uh, that have taller uh, ceilings. Um, it would increase the height uh, possibly by five feet. I don't think it's likely. We don't see uh, um, many developments uh, where they come, uh, especially on a commercial building in a downtown that they come near the, uh, the maximum height, uh, but it just allows greater uh, flexibility for architecture. And we were only doing that in the real immediate core. Um, you know, some of the buildings right now, uh, I'm not sure about the old Brooklyn Hotel, which is uh, the Long River restaurant, um, that's probably about 40 feet right now. Right. Right. So, um, but again, that's, that's three, three some odd first. stories, I believe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a three story building right now. It's got some, uh, you know, crazy angles and, and things like right. that. But. It does. Okay. Um, yeah. Just not that somebody's going to come in and, and put four story buildings, you know, in, in the town there. 
Well, I think Allison was saying that in the very beginning, uh, there was not a desire to have anything taller than three stories anywhere. Okay, and then somebody that comes in, um, they don't get an they don't get an either or. They don't have to comply. You know, it's not that they have to comply either with the number of stories or or the height. They have to comply with both of them. Okay, so, good. Um, if if the, the building department or, or planning when we're reviewing a site plan determine that they have more than a three-story building in the core, you know, then, then that's something that's not prevented. They would, um, they would be denied, you know, their permit would be denied um, for that. So they have to, it's, it's both of the criteria that they have to comply with. Okay, and then just one other thing, you know, that I, that I would just like on the record is, um, you know, I could see three-story development on the south side of Main Street I'm not sure how I feel about it and, and how the residents would feel on the north side of Main Street. That again, back there behind the town, it's residential largely. And, you know, so I would just ask that be take, taken into consideration that, that the south side of Main Street is more able to absorb a three story building than the north side. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I have Keith McCarthy, but uh, before I I um, call on Keith, I just if you don't mind, Allison and Pete, in the chat, I have some nervous folks here that I think are misunderstanding. Um, and honestly, I'm not a planner, so I I can I can completely understand the the confusion as well. A master plan, what we're here discussing tonight, and and why we're involving the community. This isn't like we're planning to develop all of Kings Park all over again. This is a, a roadmap to future decades, correct? I, if it, you know, Can you just kind of touch on, this isn't something like we're looking to just develop Kings Park right out the bat kind of a thing and just really explain what a actual master plan is. Um, you know, if you're, not a, if you're not a planner or if you're not in the industry. You wanna talk, Allison, or you wanna- Sure, to yeah. Um, so, so no, the, the town, um, the town firstly doesn't own all of the, we don't own the properties. Um, so, so we can't, uh, we can't do anything with, with those properties. The purpose of a plan is to set forth policy decisions that, um, that will guide development over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. So a master plan is a, it's a long range document. It's not something that's anticipated to, to see results in the next, you know, two or five years. I mean, you're talking over, over a long period of time. Um, we do not anticipate, if you're looking at downtown Kings Park, uh, we don't anticipate that Certainly not that 100% of the, of the properties would be redeveloped. You know, you're, there's a lot of properties there that have uh, recent improvements, um, and we would anticipate that those property owners would would keep you know what what they have. What this does is it allows people that want to to um, to improve their property, um, and, and you know within within the regulations that are set forth. So I don't know if that clarifies, if that clarifies it at all. Well, I mean, I'd like to just add to it also. Um, we're also trying to fine tune uh, the town's zoning. Right now we're basically using uh, zoning maps um, that are 50 years old. Um, a lot of the zoning goes back to before the town really even started to, uh, to develop, uh, you know, the boom in the 60s. Um, and also we're trying to make it a little bit more um, specific to each downtown. So for example, right now, downtown Kings Park, Smithtown and St. James all have the same zoning categories. It's, it's just a straight CB and the communities are so very different from one another. And um, with Kings Park, uh, with the sewers coming in there and St. James, the revitalization that's been going on there, there's really been an emphasis to try to fine tune. And that's what you look at. I mean, Smithtown Boulevard right now is just an NB uh, for Wisconsin. We, we're creating many different zoning districts and trying to fine tune what we feel is the best fit for each one of these downtowns. And that's a big part of this master plan. Thank you, Pete. Uh, all right, I'm gonna call on uh, Keith McCartney. Go ahead, Keith. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'm the new president of the Fort Salong Association. So 
I really appreciate all the members that have uh, joined us tonight. Uh, there's a lot going on that affects Fort Salonga, and uh, we'd like to be heard, not just now, but in the future. Um, one thing I'd like to clear up if possible is that when Rob talked about the bringing in garbage from New York City, I did not intend for that comment to be made from him. That comment was brought up by other people though during the COMAC talk, as well as during other times, other prior meetings, uh, including the one that you had for the organic waste facility uh, back in September of 19. The organic waste facility is our biggest concern uh, over and above Covanta at this point. And could you clarify what the plans are for that facility and where that would specifically go? There, there are no plans for, for a organic waste facility. What the town has done is, um, is created, is prepared a study for, um, for best management practices and the types of uh, what kind of a facility may be, um, may be reasonable um, within, within the town. They have uh, drafted an ordinance amendment to two chapters of the town code that would allow a fully enclosed uh, organic waste processing facility within the town. That um, there are there are no proposals. Um, the only proposal, like I had said, is just the the amendments to the uh, to the town code that would allow uh, these types of uses uh, within the town if they met certain criteria. So for anybody that that's interested. Um, I can provide a draft of the um, of the ordinance amendment that was proposed to the town board to to anybody. Um, if you want to email, you can email Smithtown Planning, um, the same email that um, that we had up for comments, and I'm happy to to send that to uh, to anybody that's interested. Um, we are currently in the process of doing an environmental impact study for those code amendments. So not for, not for a particular uh, site or, or development, but you know, similar to the comprehensive plan, we have to do an environmental review for, for any potential uh, impacts that there could be to the town. It's a lot of, what a lot of people call is, um, is a hard look. CEQA requires that the town, you know, requires the town to take a very hard look at, um, at what it is proposing. And so that's what, uh, that's the stage that we're in right now with those proposed code amendments. But again, there is, there is no, uh, there are no applications. There is, um, we don't have a particular, uh, even conceptual um, uh, request from, from anybody. So this is, this is, uh, this okay, is the town code that yeah. we're talking about, um, and I'm happy to share. I'm happy to share that with um, with anybody. Okay. And what was referenced to as far as bringing in garbage from New York City was actually the organic waste from New York City, and that's where the concern was because that was brought up in the meeting in September of 19. Okay. As far as the rail spur itself, bringing it in for Covanta, there are some significant concerns about that, whether it be pollution, whether it be noise, time of day traffic, et cetera. It's a nightmare no matter which way you do it. And I realize that we have to get uh, the ash out of there, but I don't know if doing a rail spur is the correct way of doing it. And I will send you my concerns in that email. Okay, I know Whitney had his hand up um, from his screen. So I'm gonna ask him to unmute himself and uh, go ahead, Whitney, whenever you're ready. If you're having trouble, here you go. All right. Okay. Uh, am I coming through? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Actually, my name is David. My my wife's name is Whitney. So. Uh, I apologize. I'm sorry. But that's okay. She's in charge anyway. So it's. Uh, anyhow, um, I have a uh, a question. Um, I'm I'm very concerned, especially about the uh, industrial use change. Uh, and some of these other things. So I, I have more of a question. I'm taking a step back and I, I'd like to understand what the town does um, as far as compliance 
and transparency as to the issue of conflict of interest. And, and my presumption would be that um, not just town employees, but professionals hired by the town, such as attorneys and um, architects, uh, such as uh, H2M architects, would have to make disclosures as to conflicts of interest. Uh, is, is this done in the form of affidavit? Is this written? Is there a review by someone in the town? And are these documents, as far as uh, transparency, are they in, in some section of the library somewhere where a taxpayer can go and review them? I know as a department head, I have to fill out uh, forms for uh, the Board of Ethics every year. Uh, I certainly don't have any relationship to anyone in that area. Um, I, you know, I would imagine if you wanted to see who's related to who, uh, you could contact, um, you know, the ethics board of the town of Smithtown. Um, and certainly in terms of, uh, in terms of consultants or people that, you know, contractors that are hired by the town, um, they are required to fill out and um, to fill out paperwork and uh, in the form of disclosures and that is uh, anybody selected by the town with contracts and, and the um, and the proposals that they submit are open to the public they're available to the public uh, the town attorney is the town's public informa um, the information officer and so um, so they can provide that information to people interested in, in looking yes go ahead sorry Okay, because um, one thing came up uh, with the um, the DEC gave permits to some people, and uh, Smithtown government is feeling like uh, if they got the state permit, there's nothing that can be done. But it it just seems shocking to me that they would have filed a proper application to get a permit that didn't disclose the very relevant fact that their operations were prohibited by town uh, regulations. So I, I, I can't see how the, um, the state would stand behind that. And I can't see how an attorney hired by Smithtown wouldn't see that, you know, but maybe that attorney does work for other people and maybe there's a conflict of interest there. But it, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I filled out um, uh, DEC permits, and I've had to fill out an, an Army Corps of Engineer permit, uh, and they make me swear um, and disclose both applications. And uh, Town of Islip, this is, was for a sailing club. Town of Islip, I have to do one for them. And now New York State uh, has another entity, uh, uh, the State Department. You know, I thought that was a federal. So I've I, I had four applications to do one set of dredging, and I have to swear all sorts of things at, at, to essential wildlife, and I I, I can't believe that people uh, getting a, a New York State um, DEC permit for doing light industrial or heavy industrial could possibly fill that out without swearing anything or, or failing to disclose. And, and these things are often prepared by counsel. So- I can answer that. A, a, a lot of what you're talking about in that area happened 45 and 50 years ago. That, that's when those permits were given out, a lot of those, and, that's, and then when they went to court, what happened was the judge said, well, you've been doing this for 25 years, you know, not it's still in residential, but they're doing light industrial, we're not gonna, we're not gonna find you. And that, that's what happened. You know, it's not right, but you know, the one lucky thing we have now is a lot of these properties are changing hands. So when they change hands, now the town's gonna force them, which I believe they're doing. I think there's more to the story. Um, I, I would I would like to be able to go someplace and see these conflict uh, disclosures. Uh, and, and my concern is much less with, you know, town employees. It's the people we hire. It's, you know, the architects and mostly the lawyers. And I think we have to stay up on making sure they fill these things out 
and we should have these documents um, where they're easily accessible by taxpayers, like online. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm done. Sure. And and just letting everybody know again that this is being recorded. The comments are being recorded as well. That um, the comment that, that you brought up is um, is certainly something we will move forward with to the town attorney, um, and and you can follow up directly if you'd like with the town attorney's office. But um, but we will let the town attorney know. Councilwoman Andrella was on, so I know she will she will be in contact with the town attorney's office as well. So thank you. Uh, okay, so I have uh, people put your hand up, and I see Karen was uh, trying to raise her hand from her from her camera. Back. So I'm going to call Mike, Teresa, and then Karen, and I have a couple of other girls after her. Um, so could, um, excuse me. Could Whitney or Donald? There you go. Thank you. Yeah, I just muted them. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's always tricky with Zoom. Uh, so I'm gonna call Mike Rosado. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yeah, I, I have uh, uh, several questions. So the first one with the, uh, uh, involves the Nisiquad River State Park. Uh, uh, several months or maybe over a year ago, uh, the town met with state parks officials about a traffic circle on St. John Lynn Road at the entrance of Nisiquad River State Park by the, uh, the toll booth. Mm -hmm. Is that still be, being considered or is that in the master plan? That was being uh, considered uh, by state parks. Uh, we were, when we spoke uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Scott Fish, he was very interested in that. And uh, it was state parks that was the ones that were um, spearheading that project. They were uh, pursuing some grant money and they wanted to put a traffic circle uh, right where uh, the boulevard uh, meets uh, the entrance by the gatehouse, by you know, right in front of York Hall. Right. Um, I haven't heard anything more about it. We uh, did design plans for them, uh, sent it to them, um, but it was their uh, their project. Uh, Scott has since uh, retired. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, if Chip Gorman and his crew are doing it. Um, I think it's being definitely incorporated, possibly into their master plan. Um, Planning department staff had a meeting last Thursday with the uh, consultants um, for Nisiquag River State Park uh, master plan. Mm -hmm. um, and they were asking for copies of uh, the plans that we had done for that. So oh, I don't think it's dead. It's just, um, you know, it's um, part of the process. Yeah, it's part yes. of the process and it's quiet right now. Okay. Uh, would you guys uh, prefer an underpass as opposed to a traffic circle? I personally, I, I like the traffic circle. I thought it was uh, very similar to what you find at, um, you know, Jones Beach and um, um, Robert Moses and Smith Point. And I thought it would fit pretty well there. Um, the underpass, I thought it might take up too much property. Okay. Um, but this is the first I'm hearing of that idea. I know we're trying to get the hike and bike trail to cross over from uh, Tiffany Field where the uh, soccer fields are. Right. into the park itself in a much safer manner. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're open-minded, but traditionally uh, an underpass, uh, you know, is a lot more costly than something that's all at grade. Yeah, I'm just thinking what would be safer. Right. Uh, I guess- Oh, we even, we even talked one time about doing an overpass just for the hike and bike trail, uh, okay. because the railroad spur at one time used to cross over St. John Lynn Road right. further to the west uh, when the power plant was uh, closer to where the new DEC building's under construction. And, you know, something along the lines of what you see all along, um, like the, you know, um, upstate uh, in the bike trails, uh, you know, or uh, the new uh, uh, bridge at Sunken Meadow where the dam used to be. Right. Okay. Uh, with regards to downtown revitalization, um, uh, have has, uh, moving the power lines, the power and cable lines underground? Is that part of the discussion? Um, it's very difficult. We just went through that whole uh, process with Lake Avenue and St. James and everybody wanted the utility lines uh, removed. And St. James uh, is worse off because uh, they have it on both sides of the street. Uh, the, the 
electric lines were on the, the west side of the street and the Verizon poles were on the east side. Mm -hmm. We had numerous meetings with all of the utilities involved and um, it was I impossible. Uh, PSEG, they are, they'll, they'll tell you the first thing, they're an above ground utility. They're not interested in uh, burying lines. We even talked about putting them at least behind the buildings just to spruce up the streetscape. Um, and we really did not get anywhere with uh, any of the utilities. I can add to that if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Please. Um, one of the things that we were able to do and, and Mitch Crowley at Traffic uh, it's literally spent a, a year working on, on organizing it because it's, it's very complicated was to clean up a lot of the clutter on those lines. Right. Um, there were the old analog lines which are the big fat wires you see at the bottom uh, at the lowest of uh, at the pole right. uh, they they got a couple of of business owners that were still using the old system to upgrade um and and really they're they're starting the cleaning process on lake and it's it's noticeable so that's something we could we could definitely broach with PSEG too i mean we'll still fight for um you know for for cleaning up uh, those those power lines or like pete said moving them uh, in a different location, but but the, definitely when it comes to cleaning up those lines, uh, that's something we can do. Yeah, I mean, there's just not a lot of sidewalk space mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. And with the power poles, uh, with the poles, you know, like lo located right uh, on the sidewalk, it just, it's gonna make it difficult to, you know, to really make, uh, you know, make downtown work properly. So it's too bad that we can't force them to, to move those poles or, or I'm sorry, to relocate the lines underground. Yeah, Mike, it's something that, um, that in both the, the comprehensive plan and the Kings Park master plan um, are called out as priorities to improve the, the streetscape by at the very least trying to relocate the poles um, to the backs of properties that ultimately it's, it's not a town decision. The town can, we can do the best we can, like we've done, um, you know, as Peter was talking about in, in St. James, where they did the, uh, the reconstruction of the road, you know, meeting for a, a year to, um, to get them to, to do something to at least improve the, the visual quality there. Right. Um, so the town will, will work you know, similarly to, um, to you know, with PSEG and Verizon to to relocate those poles and to remove the wires that are unused, um, because uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, you've got you have a whole stretch of downtown Kings Park that um, it's really difficult to uh, to walk through. It's quite it's narrow, and a lot of that is because of the the poles that that. Um, right. that you know. Um, uh, with, with regards to sewers, um, you know, I saw the map and, uh, as to where the sewer lines are, are planned, uh, are, are you, that you're planning for the locations where you're planning to install the sewer lines. Uh, how come the school district is not in, involved or will be, or, or part of that plan? Uh, so that's it's a county um, it's a county project. The town um, the town was not uh, involved in in determining locations for for exactly where the sewer lines would go. We were involved to an extent when they started the feasibility uh, study back in two thousand and nine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's ultimately it's the the county's decision. So I don't know. Um, I, I don't think I can expand upon that. Peter Scully is probably the best person in the county right. to speak to if there's- um, Was the school district consulted or asked about uh, participating in that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, Mike. And the only thing you know I can think of just from an engineering standpoint, uh, the proposed pump station would be uh, in close proximity right on uh, the parks department property. Um, right which is uh, the low spot opposite the uh, post office. And I don't know if it has something to do with, uh, you know, from that point east, um, they're pumping uh, to the uh, treatment plant. So I don't know, like the high school, it might be an issue. You can't connect a pipe into a force main because then uh, the waste would be going back into the building. I, again, it's their project, but, uh, you know, maybe uh, the RJO and uh, William T. Rogers buildings, maybe there's, uh, feasibility there because uh, the, the line is supposed to go up to the Kingswood apartments. 
Right. It just seems like a missed opportunity because the no. line the, the line is going right past the middle school. Anybody there can sign up if they want. Oh, they the can. School. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the whole okay. point. I mean, it could be you put it in and no one signs up. Right. OK. That's good to know. Uh, lastly, the, the industrial area. Um, the proposal to uh, to rezone uh, most of the area west of Sunken Meadow Parkway to, to, to heavy industry is uh, is absurd. I think you guys would agree. And, and, and I believe that's not something you guys recommended. It was recommended by the consultants. Am I right? It was, that was the recommendation in the plan as, I mean, as we had said, um, that recommendation, we do not see that recommendation moving forward uh, as, as it's been proposed. Um, I think if there is, uh, there will likely be some um, limited HI heavy industry. Um, however, I think it's gonna be uh, compressed quite, quite a bit. Um, and that'll depend on on you know the communications that supervisor has has with the community. So now, now, now most of the landowners are out of compliance because they're using their property for outdoor storage. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So they're not they're not technically using it for the obnoxious uses like asphalt manufacturing or concrete manufacturing or crushing or anything like that. Well, there are a couple, but they're illegal. Like King, Kings Park Industries has an asphalt plant next to MSF, but you know, that is a legal uh, use. Uh, that's, a, that's a legal use, right? right? Carlson Brothers, you know, they have, uh, you know, approval for the uh, concrete uh, plant that's there. For right, the that, but that's on heavy, is, is, it, is it not? Correct, correct. Yeah. Right. But the so bulk of it is outdoor storage, uh, Nicolia, you know, landscape yards, things to that nature. Right, but the point I'm trying to make is, so so if, if most of, most of the, a, a league, so-called illegal uses are outdoor storage. Mm -hmm. uh, why not just keep it light? You, are, you already changed the ordinance that Correct. allows outdoor storage as long as it's coupled with the primary use, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think it's loud and clear. And, um, you know, this is a draft. And, um, and again, the process has been going on for a couple of years. Um, when this started, um, outdoor storage wasn't permitted at all in the uh, light industrial zoning district. Right. We've since created the ability to put outdoor storage in the LI zoning district by special exception approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals. So now at least it is an option. In the past, we had some applications um, to change the zoning to uh, WSI. And WSI was more like a Jericho Turnpike zoning. And there was concern of the town board. Well, why go to WSI? Now we're allowing them the ability to put car dealerships, uh, right. office buildings, or things that were just completely out of place. So the solution uh, for now, and it's for the most part been working, is to allow outdoor storage in LI, but with special approvals. Um, that's not to say that everybody down there, you know, is legitimate. No, you know, they need to now come in for applications and, uh, you know, and the approval process. Right, and, and I understand that's difficult to do for pre-existing uses because a lot of them uh, have no incentive to come in because it will only hike their uh, tax bills and make them uh, uh, have to adhere to, to the current rules of, of, of the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, no, there's no incentive, but when properties change hands, uh, that's when you guys have the upper hand, right? If it, it's when the, when the properties change hands or if somebody comes in and they want to change the use on the property. If they want to change the use legally, yes, that's when you have the upper, but the sale of property from one person to another doesn't send uh, an application our way. Right, right. But, but they have no legal standing to fight you in court at that point for a pre-existing use, correct? I don't quite follow the question, but you know, if one piece of property changes hands from one person to another, and if they change the use, absolutely, they're supposed to be coming to the town of Smithtown. Um, but um, you know, we don't see the change of hands, and we really don't have any kind of power to push them. I mean, you can write summonses and hope through enforcement. You bring them into the town to make applications and bring them into enforcement, right, uh, into compliance. 
um, but it's not always happening. Right, and you know who I'm referring to. It's just, what I don't understand is that a, a major parcel has changed hands down there and uh, the town is still not enforcing the rules. Uh, so you, you, have, you have somebody who went in there, regraded, put up blocks eight and a half feet high, took down part of the slope, and the town issued stop work orders and then apparently allowed them continue regrading after breaking the rules. So how are we ever gonna gain control of that area if we continue to allow things like that to happen? I know the site you're talking about and um, they were told no further work at this point. Um, we uh, inspected the property uh, just this past Tuesday uh, to see that what they're doing uh, was in compliance. Um, we found that what they were doing is in compliance, uh, but they've been basically, they have been told uh, you're at the limit. You can't do anything more than what has been done. And any further uh, work at that site does require approval from the Board of Site Plan Review. Yeah, but Pete, if I may jump in here. And it's not you by any stretch. Yeah, of I mean, I don't want to talk just about one parcel. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the key is it have, you have, that's the whole point of this whole thing. You can't allow that to happen. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying it was you and it wasn't you. They built an eight foot wall and they were allowed to grade in behind it. And that's wrong. And what does that say to every other land over there? The guys who are playing by the rules. That's the crux of the problem down there. And you're letting it continue. Not you, but the town is. And that's wrong. Yeah, and then, you know, and then, and then, you know, from an environmental standpoint, I mean, you have that same land, same uh, landowner on another parcel that he's owned for quite some time, you know, draining water, draining a uh, rainwater and wastewater from his property onto a public road. And you have nobody doing anything about that either. So I, I it's just, and, and again, you know, as, as legislator Trotta said, it has nothing to do with, with you, Pete or Allison or the planning department, but if the town doesn't step in and stop these things and encourage, uh, you know, the proper uses of these properties, so they're taxed properly, uh, which would uh, in turn uh, help our, help the Kings Park School District with tax rateables, because right now, you have most of those people not paying their fair share of taxes. They have structures on their property, not being taxed. They're not doing anything that they're supposed to be doing. So, I mean, there has to be a plan. I mean, it's gotta be part of the master plan to bring these people into compliance. Because- uh, The only thing I can do, Mike, I mean, I can discuss it, uh, you know, with our public safety and town attorney's office and um, it, it takes more than just one department and one person. We need to all be, uh, you know, in a cohesive uh, uh, unit uh, as far as if we're going to attack this. And I mean, that's the only thing I can do right now is, um, you know, discuss it with the, all the departments that have to be involved in order for that to happen. Okay, thanks, Pete. Also, uh, I can add to, with, with regards to uh, what Allison was speaking on earlier about supervisor and the town council coordinating a Zoom meeting with the local civic and, uh, and similar organizations regarding this particular area. Um, we wanted to wait till tonight because it's, you know, we had the COMAC civic groups on calls the other night, but we also have Kings Park tonight and we want to make sure we have everybody uh, that we want, we don't want to exclude anybody from the conversation. So I will begin emailing everyone from, from the call tonight uh, and sorry, the Zoom meeting tonight and also from COMAC um, tomorrow and see if we can get something together. I will include the town attorney uh, as well as uh, asking public safety. So maybe there's, you know, in addition to discussions about, about the master plan, maybe there's a suggestion or an idea that comes up that can help resolve this uh, moving forward. Okay, I'm sorry, Teresa is next. Go ahead, Teresa. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things I wanted to add, and I think Mike brought up a, a very good point, is that without enforcement, it puts everything in jeopardy. I think that's why you saw a grilling on the height of the floors. 
because could that, um, could a two story become a third story when they're allowing 40, 45 feet? And if you don't have enforcement in one area, there's loss of confidence that there's enforcement in any area. And I think that that, that um, makes it difficult for people to feel confident for any changes in general. Now, it's my, am I correct that as of right now, the zoning is not, zoning would need to be changed in order for organic waste. Am I correct there? That's correct. Right, and so if I may just say, and again, you know, you hear enforcement, it just makes you somewhat mistrustful that changing the zoning, although there's no plan currently, is certainly cracking the barn door. Right, so even though there isn't a concrete plan, there could be a whisper of a plan. And I think one of the things that I find a little bit confusing when we talk about downtown revitalization, as I have listened very carefully through all of this, sometimes I hear redevelopment of buildings and sometimes I hear new development of buildings. And when you look at how many buildings are empty, um, Empty storefronts, empty buildings are bad for business everywhere. And I, I don't see how it would benefit us to put up new buildings if they're still empty buildings. And so that doesn't quite make sense to me. And, you know, they're all kind of interrelated. Starting at 3.30, you can't head west. I'm sorry, you can't head east on Main Street. It's a very narrow road. They're very narrow sidewalks, but it is increasingly congested and there are many stores that are empty. You know, what happens with all of that traffic? Some of that traffic is due to the rail because the lights are prolonged during the commuter hour. And then you hear about a rail being added possibly to organic waste. And, you know, I, I would love to know what the alternatives to the waste are and if they could be posted on the website because, you know, Brookhaven although it's been there for a long, long time, it was not a forever solution. And are these solutions, even for an organic waste, are they short-term solutions with long-term ramifications? And you know, in some of these areas that we have discussed in the Zoom meeting tonight are extremely detrimental to this area, which has always been somewhat of a hamlet, you know, very close to all highways, but once off a highway is very residential. And we are looking more and more commercial. And I can't imagine, and not even an efficient, effective commercial, just because of the way the roads are narrow and the, um, the telephone poles are so close to the road and so close to business that, uh, and, and then, you know, you still have wetlands and, and the impact to the land. I really think that more consideration and more enforcement needs to be put into all of this for decades to come. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, okay, so I have uh, Maureen next. I know Keith has a quick comment, three second comment. Um, I'm gonna, uh, Keith, you, you, did you, are you, is, is time an issue for you? No, this is, like I said, take three seconds. Okay. I just went outside to walk my dog and it stinks out there. And I'm just north of uh, Plasky Road. It stinks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Maureen, I just, uh, I just sent you a ask to unmute. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Good evening, everybody. My name is Maureen Fritch. I reside in Fort Salonga. Um, I'm going to speak about, and I know it seems redundant, but I think it's important that um, all the residents um, are able to voice their opinion so that you know how strong the opinion is of everybody in the community and not just of a few. Um, the last woman, I think, um, hit the nail on the head um, when Ms. Murray said that um, it's not intended for the industrial area to go from low to high as maybe a blanket decision, but somewhere along the line, some parcels might be given that high industrial um, zoning. Um, I think she said it perfectly. Once you open that door, uh, it's Pandora's box. 
And you know that people will come out, especially businesses, with their team of attorneys, and they will sue the town and say, but Mr. Jones got to put his business in over there and he got high industrial. So why can't I have high industrial? And I think that once that Pandora's box is open, the town is not going to be able to close it. In addition, um, you also have the situation of the noise pollution. Um, I can't speak for everybody else, but in our neighborhood, the neck of Fort Salonga, our taxes are well over $20,000 a year. Um, there's no mention to the cost of how this is gonna impact us as far as a tax base. Um, I know many people, many residents, my neighbors, a lot of people are very concerned that our taxes are gonna go up tremendously. Um, there's a lot of development. Development is not free. It costs a lot of money. And um, if you look at that particular area, um, I think that if once you start um, letting one person have high industrial, um, you're, you're just gonna open that door and you're gonna have many, many companies either suing the town or wanting to try to take over a larger parcel and maybe grow a much larger industrial park than what you have there right now. Um, one of the other concerns is with, with the industrial is that um, you know, there's a pollution issue. Um, the cancer rate on Long Island is through the roof. And I don't mean to speak out of turn here, but in this particular area in Fort Salonga, I know more people with cancer than people who don't have cancer. And I think the health of the residents of Fort Salonga and Kings Park need to be very, very concerned over any further industrial um, growth in this area because it's impacting us, it's impacting our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And I'm very concerned over the health of the residents. I also don't know, and maybe someone could answer me this, um, is that once the DEC um, gives um, a business a permit, um, I also owned a, a parcel in Mattituck and we're going through the same thing right now. So I know all about Secra and everything else. Um, the DEC seems to pass out permits very readily, like they're candy. Just fill out an application, hand it in, and everybody seems to get a DEC permit. Must be great. And their responsibility is to protect the environment. And I don't see them doing their job as well as they should do. It's like government at its worst. I hate to say it, but it's true. And um, if this person um, applies for a DEC permit, and then they, there's no oversight by the town of Smithtown and they sell their property, what's to say that they don't pass the DEC permit along with the sale of their property? And now the next person has it. And there's no oversight by the town of Smithtown um, to be able to follow that. I believe Mr. Um, Peter Hahn said that. You don't, you don't have a way to keep an eye on who's selling their properties, who's passing their DEC permits back and forth, and once somebody owns a parcel of land or a business and they've had a DEC permit and they go to uh, sell it and they go to the DEC and say, oh, but it already had a permit on it. If DEC is handing these permits out like candy, they're gonna get another DEC permit with the new owner. So I, I think it's really relevant that, that you do not open that door. I know that there is some type of a plan to do something with the, the waste that's coming out of there and the ash and everything. I know that's what's on the planning board's mind and that's your concern, but I think we need to find other ways of doing this because I think once you zone what you're looking to zone for high industrial to meet your, your future plan that really isn't 100% clear to everybody. Um, I know it's, I, I think that we're, we're gonna have major problems. And one of the questions I also have is, how is this gonna impact bread and cheese? What is the plan with bread and cheese? Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hype about bread and cheese and that it's gonna be widened and there's gonna be large tractor trailers coming down bread and cheese. And a lot of people are concerned about that area as well. Can I speak to that please, Allison? Uh, sure. Um, and then I saw uh, Legislator Trotta also, and I note that um, 
Uh, they're not widening um, bread and cheese, however. Okay, in May of last okay. year, the town of Huntington designated their side of bread and cheese as an historic roadway. That, in effect, stopped any possibility of the county going ahead and doing their plan. Uh, we're trying to work with Smithtown to do the same thing, uh, but the laws are different between the two towns, and we're trying to get that uh, figured out. Okay. There's actually... Um... A, a communication going on be currently between the two supervisors regarding bread and cheese. Uh, it is something that that everybody is is aware of and, and working together uh, for the community right now too. Okay, and this this plan that's in effect, how does it impact the taxes for this area? Because the the taxes already are crippling everybody. So how does this new proposed plan? Um, affect the residents and their taxes. Are you referring to the master plan or the, ma the master plan? It, it doesn't impact. There's no cost. It was it was budgeted for. Um, I, Nicole, I think she's um, sorry. I, I think um, Ms. Bridges is referring to you know, okay. once, if there is development that occurs as a result of of the uh, recommendations in the plan what will the impact on, on the taxes be? Right. Um, uh, I, can, I can say certainly that the intention is to, is to not increase taxes. The um, environmental impact statement does do a, um, an economic, a socioeconomic uh, uh, review. Howard may be able to explain um, what, uh, what's included in, in that review, but it, it looks at the number of, of school age children that would be that would be added as a result of implementing um, this plan, uh, what the tax base is, how it would impact the tax base, um, and so Howard, do you can you explain the what the socioeconomic um, considerations would be? Well, Allison, you did a very good job of covering it. It's basically uh, school children. It's um, you know, uh, municipal services, fire, uh, police, all of those costs and any impacts in increasing the costs are looked at as are the tax increases associated with the, sorry, the property tax increases associated with business or industrial improvements and what they are paying in increased taxes and whether or not those increased tax revenues offset the increased costs. All of that is in preparation now for inclusion in the draft EIS. It's being done by our consultants. And as part of that, um, what, what the consultants have to do is develop what's called a, a build out scenario, a maximum build out. So over the next 30 years, if this plan is implemented, what is the maximum uh, uh, expected um, uh, development that that would be anticipated as a result of the plan, and they have to look at not just what the reason what the uh, development would be as a result of implementing this plan, but also what development would be as a result of, of not adopting a plan. So you know, continuing um, the the existing conditions, and then they take the the total uh, the total development and and impacts. Um, from both of those alternatives and compare what the impact on, uh, not just on the tax base, but I mean, in this particular case, we're talking about the tax base, um, but also on the environment, on traffic, on air quality, um, on uh, community facilities and cultural resources. So, um, so, so it does, it looks at not just what the, what's recommended as part of the plan, but also if the plan were not to move forward and if were to, you know, existing zoning were to remain in place, what the uh, maximum development would be as a result of that. So that you know, people get, we get a, we all get a, a clear uh, understanding at that point of how much of a difference are we talking about and what kind of impacts are, are associated directly um, with that. It does end up being a very lengthy um, document. Um, I mean, you're talking hundreds of, of pages once, once all is said and done, but, um, but there are certainly parts of it that are, that I think people uh, on this call would be interested in, 
in reviewing. Um, and I know that uh, we provide a summary for um, for the town board once um, you know once a plan once the environmental impact statement is um, is prepared and is ready for acceptance by the town board. Um, we'd certainly encourage everybody to to come back, you know, at at that point for um, for that public comment period in that hearing. Um, but that information is required to be evaluated uh, by the consultant and. Um, and so. so, so at this point in time, there's no real percentage of um, in in your planning of what it would actually cost each resident, you know, for this entire uh, plan that you have going. I forward. may answer that quickly. If it's a good plan, if it's a great plan, it won't affect your taxes at all. They should actually go down. But if it's a bad plan, your taxes are going to go up. Well, a good a good plan as far as what? A good plan as far in as terms of, big, in terms of industrial coming in and picking no, up the in tail. terms of in terms of properly taxing what you have there now and bringing in senior housing that doesn't put kids in the school and balancing it out correctly because we're losing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars by not taxing that industrial era properly. So this is a good thing. Yeah, it's also about creating a plan that's sustainable. Um, you know, a big part of it is uh, capital projects. Um, you want a plan that's sustainable. That's something that's uh, not going to keep uh, uh, requiring upgrades uh, around the town to our facilities. Um, but also one of the big goals of the master plan, or the reason to have this master plan, is to set the, um, the zoning. Um, right now, like I said, we haven't had a master plan update since 1961. And so everybody's kind of come in sporadically over the years and say, you know what? I want to change this uh, single family residential property to garden apartments. And it's always basically been at the whim of the planning board, the town board to decide whether or not it makes sense. If we get a master plan, it's very, very, and, and it sets out what the community wants it's very, very difficult to ask for a zoning that differs from what the master plan shows. So, you know, if it calls out that it's supposed to be half acre residential and you decide I wanna go for uh, condominiums in that area, um, it's very, very difficult and it makes it very difficult for an attorney to sue the town and win. And that's been one of the, the problems because again, we haven't had a plan in place and it's been haphazard. So I only bring this up because you were asking about um, like if one person uh, changes their property to HI and it sets a precedent, well, it's going to be very difficult to do if this master plan says that that property should be LI and not HI uh, to go to something diff uh, uh, something else. And then also this plan will not just be for like the next 50 years. This will need to routinely be um, updated uh, like town of Huntington and some of the surrounding towns, they're every about 15 years that they're upgrading uh, their master plan. That just shows how long it's been. I mean, we have a 50, 60 year gap here and we're trying to really get this in place. And that really gives us a little bit more teeth when it comes to enforcement and how the town is developed. Okay, one other thing I'd just like to, to, to mention is um, a lot of people have spoken about how they're very upset. I've been reading all the comments that they're writing back and forth that um, we really haven't received anything in the mail. Um, I, I, this is the first time that I even knew that this, this master plan was in play and you've been planning it for two years and yet I've been living here for almost 20. And I'm just hearing it for the first time, but my tax bill comes on time every year to my address. So I don't understand how uh, some type of mass mailing could have not been sent out to the residents. Um, a lot of residents are very, they're, they're unaware of it. They, they do not know about it. And I'm just gonna bring one other thing that's a side note um, because it, it, it really is a bone of contention for my neighbors on Spinnaker Court. And that's where I live is on Spinnaker off of 25A. And there is a residential home that's um, on 25A that backs up against Spinnaker Court. And I don't know how, but the town approved for a gigantic structure to be built behind this person's house. And I don't know how in God's name, 
when you can't get a shed up around here without jumping through hoops that somebody could build, I believe, and maybe one of my, I know my neighbors are on, somebody should chime in with the square footage of how big this structure is in a residential area. And they took down all the trees that went down the whole length behind Spinnaker Court and they put up this gigantic structure. So my concern is there's very, very poor, poor oversight. And, and so yes, everybody's very nervous and very concerned over this new great plan um, for the area. So I think that the neighbors would like um, better communication and a better outreach to the community because I saw all your little blue dots, Ms. Murray, and I appreciate that, but there's a lot of blue dots that were not hit because most of the people I know didn't know anything about it. I could touch on the mail if, if you want. Sure. Um, the, the post mailing the, uh, the, the survey was actually something we discussed at the very beginning of the, of the plan, uh, in, in order to, to for the, the, the length of the, of the survey and how specific it is for each person there, there's, there's the Smithtown as a whole factor. And then there's the Hamlet factor. Um, I believe when we priced it out to, to create uh, to mail it and then to have the, it actually be returned in the mail, uh, it would have cost about $61,000 per Hamlet, which is almost a little, it's, I think it's like 366,000, I believe is, was the total cost is almost half of the budget for the master plan. Um, so what we did was uh, when we put our recycling calendar out, uh, the, there's a letter from the town board uh, in in that recycling calendar, we we took the opportunity to to let folks know that we were updating the master plan and to uh, to log into the to the website to get information on the public input meetings that we were having, um, and we and and that's kind of how we solved that that fiscal issue. Uh, we've uh, we did work with, I, I believe if, if most of the folks here, I believe are from the Fort Salonga Association, I believe there was a recent changeover in leadership. Uh, we've updated our contacts since then uh, so we can inform uh, each civic group individually and so that they pass it on to their civic association members. Um, and, uh, and, and we've updated it since then. Um, but that was, that was the big issue with regards to mailing it. In addition to that, in addition to the cost, the statistics of, of mail and where st statistically mailing, uh, information that requires you to participate back a call to action statistics are less than 0.04% of a return. So when you look at what you're spending, uh, and it's your it's your money it's your tax dollars so we, you know it just wasn't a a fiscally responsible decision um, at, for for the return that we would have gotten uh, so instead we did the you know we we ran full page ads in the Smithtown News in the in all the local papers we got quite a bit of of press from uh, from editors in Newsday and on the patch, uh, all of the other, you know, smaller local papers like uh, the Times Beacon, uh, Smithtown Matters, um, the you Messenger. The flyers home with all the students and yep. all the school districts. Um, I think people are forgetting it was about two years ago. I mean, there really hasn't been much outreach in the past year because we've been doing all the internal review, but uh, all the solicitation of comments, uh, that goes back to when we were having the public hearings in each of the hamlets. And we tried to take it a step further and not just have like one public hearing at the town. We really did our best to go out into each community. We had public hearings at Comac High School, Kings Park High School, Great Hollow Middle School in Wisconsin, St. James, Kings Park, Hop Hog. So we went out into each district and uh, contacted the school districts. It's just that it, it was about two years ago uh, that that process was going on. Right, the flyers in the um, in the downtowns, the build the the building buildings. Okay, I, I'm just I'm just relaying that there's a lot of people in our area that are. This is the first they're hearing of it, so they're they're kind of surprised and they're kind of shocked. So may, maybe a, a little better outreach um, would help. Um, not not this will be my last comment, but the um, 
when I spoke before about the uh, permit that was given to the family on 25A behind Spinnaker Court, it's an 8,000 square foot building that's 30 feet high. And it removed every tree on three acres of land that the neighbors on Spinnaker Court that face that side are left with barren and listening to, I mean, it's literally a gigantic building that went up. So, I mean, Mr. Hans, it's, you're, you're know, part of the Smith Town. Yeah. I mean, how did that get approved? Um, well, it was actually, uh, they applied for a building permit and they were denied. Um, they were denied the permit um, and sent to the Board of Zoning Appeals. I can't speak on behalf of the Board of Zoning Appeals, um, mm. but um, variances were approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals before they could be issued building permits. Um, what is it? What is it? A, 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 to a, my knowledge, I, I don't it's know. It's supposed what to be for. a detached, uh, I don't want to say a garage because. Yeah, that's I what agree. they're saying it is, it is a garage. Yeah. But, but it's like a big, to big to enough to hold, like it could be like a dealership. I mean, it's it's just, it's disgraceful that it was allowed to be approved. And and I and again, it goes back to oversight. Yeah, it goes back to oversight though. So So what happens, what happens, and this is a perfect example, okay? What happens when you have um, industrial, light industrial zoning and you give heavy industrial to one or two people and they appeal it and they go to the zoning board, okay? And, and what, they're gonna get approved. Because I mean, if they can put in something that size in a residential neighborhood behind Spinnaker Court, what's to stop it from, from, from making all those other lots high industrial? There, there isn't very good oversight, so the community doesn't feel very comfortable. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Richard, Maureen, that's a good, a good point that you're making. It's Vinny. Um, what's going on behind Spinnaker obviously is a big mistake by the town. To say it was denied, but then went to zoning appeals and then got approved it sounds ridiculous to me. It's 8,000 square feet and uh, someone asked, what is it? Well, in the plans, it was supposed to be a garage. I've never seen an 8,000 square foot garage before owned personally. Obviously, the big garages that are commercial. And I met the guy and it's a lot more than a garage. I went inside and there's bathrooms and fireplaces and, and all kinds of things going on there. And hundreds of trees that were taken down from property that we thought was never going to be allowed to be built on. And one of the reasons why I bought this house six years ago was for the privacy, which is gone now. So he wants to put in a built-in pool. It's a house, 8,000, it's bigger than my house, 8,000 square feet. And it's all I see when I look in my backyard and my neighbor to the south of me has it even worse. I mean, you look out his back door and all you see is an 8,000 square foot building now. Um, I know this isn't what we came here to talk about, but I think the point that Maureen was trying to make is that we can't trust that the right things are going to be done here. I, I know I have no trust in it, so <laughs> that's what I have to say. Okay, so I, I know I skipped over Karen before and she's had her hand up and then I have Alex after Karen. So uh, Karen, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, you gotta, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Go ahead. You have to the mute button is on your lower left. Oh. There you go. Oh, did I hear you? Can you? Yes. No, I can. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. I, I what I wanted to say is that this is a common ploy, uh, waiting for the denial and then uh, taking it to the ZBA, and that's part of the problem. There are ways around everything, and so the friends and neighbors that I have on the southern end of Fort Salonga are so vehemently opposed to any even consideration for heavy industry because that just continues to open the door and allow for one area, one segment <clears throat> of Smithtown to be thrown under the bus with all of these various non-compliant, um, huge operations that basically do whatever they want. And even though, as Holy people Lord. said, 
there might be an effort to enforce and monitor. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for 30 years. So yeah, a master plan is good, but we need to spread out, not concentrate all of these objectionable, objectionable uh, businesses. And the one question that everyone brings up to me is why is it that Smithtown is concerned with uh, removing trash and ash from Covanta when it's a Huntington facility? So I, we may just be overlooking some of the facts, but maybe somebody could address that. Why is this a Smithtown problem? Because we burn our garbage there. Yeah, the, the Covanta so, plant uh, serves uh, town of Huntington and Smithtown. Both townships bring all of their uh, waste to that facility. It just sure. happens to be over the line, but that facility is burning the garbage for both townships. That's right. Everybody knows that, but but then why isn't Huntington finding a way for the ash to be removed? Why is it falling into Smithtown's uh, purview? Oh, Again, oh. go ahead. All, all towns are responsible for their solid waste. So Huntington has the same issue as well. Um, so it, you know, once it leaves the, the curb, the town is responsible, whether it's through carters um, that, that make their way from your home to uh, municipal services facility to Covanta, uh, but, but regarding the, the waste pr uh, problem, once that land, the, the landfill is closed in Brookhaven, uh, every single town uh, has to is responsible for for the waste in their township. Sure, but then the spur, if there is one, or the whatever to to remove it, is in is is just south of uh, of Fort Solano, bordering Comac, and west of the Parkway. So, why isn't there a meeting of the minds with some of the other towns to come up with uh, another? location so that again all of this is not concentrated in one place we just don't have confidence that anything can be enforced since there seem to be so many seems to be so many ways around it nobody well I, I'm sorry I was waiting to see if anybody wanted to jump in but <laughs> So I mean, I, mean, I, I could jump in. I, I could jump in. The town of Huntington is going to say we have an incinerator on our plant. So you try to you try to concentrate it where it's sort of together and away from as much possible people as you possibly can. And when you look at it on a map, it's not a bad spot for it because there's limited houses. You have railroad tracks. You have the buffer. Then you have Pulaski Road. So is that there's never going to be a perfect spot. Yes, you have said that about three times, and I appreciate it. I think there's some validity. But I think that again, uh, we have to move this around. We have to spread it out. We can't have it in one place because it borders Comac. It borders some of the residences and uh, the residential areas in Kings Park and it borders Fort Solana. All of that being part of Smithtown. So why don't we find someplace else? You keep saying that it has okay, to let go me somewhere. Let me, let me ask you a here? question. Let me, yeah. where, where are you I, gonna put, so, like where would you, let's use the rail spur. Okay. You have the plant right there. You have an industrial area. You have a train track buffer. Should we put it in Wisconsin? Does that make sense? Should we put it in Smithtown? Does that make sense? So now we have a place in Smithtown. We take the truck with the ash. We drive it to Smithtown. It's the only logical place. Now, hopefully we don't have to do that. There's something comes up, but in case, in case we have to, we should have a plan. And that's it's, what this is. It's not a bad plan if it wasn't on top of a zillion vehicles illegally parked right near there, uh, right? You know what I'm talking about? No, I, I don't. The, um, the, the, the third Adjana property? The, well, that's, that's all being zoned differently also. They'll, they'll be gone at some point. They're not gonna be gone, Rob. Well, they'll, they'll be- They've been to about Adjana for years and now oh, look what we're facing. Did, it. It, it, do, do there, you know that tonight they, they, they just did had the, the Rauschenberg hearing and once again, lack of compliance. It's just one thing after another. And although what, you make I didn't, I didn't hear what you said about the hearing. The, 
it was thrown, it was dismissed again, because there's a lack of compliance allowed, a lack of compliance with the commitments that they made. It just, this is 30 years. So we're You're used, not, I agree we're with you with that. Carlson. Carlson. Where else, where else should thing. you go? You're right. If that were the only thing, I think you'd have a really good argument, but it's just on top of all of these. I don't other... disagree with you. I do not disagree. I, I know what you're saying, but there's got to be some give and take. You know, I'll look. Give. It's just take. That's well, what Smithtown has to deal with when they evaluate this master plan. When I can't they go up. out in my backyard because it smells like dump. You know, what do you expect me to do? And it's going to get that much worse. Okay. There are a lot of unhappy people here. Just let me leave it at that. It's 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 too many years of well, where else should this go? Well, it can't keep coming here. Thank you. Okay, so I know Alex has patiently um, had his hand up. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of uh, town officials um, and employees for uh, taking our questions and uh, putting everything out to us. Um, it's very much appreciated your time. And uh, I see this meeting going longer and longer. So thank you for your patience. Um, so I have a, a couple questions. Um, first is, uh, I guess, you know, there's been a lot of talk about violation um, and a history of, of citations and things like that. Is there some sort of a public record of where this can be seen easily instead of digging, you know, through the archives? I know how difficult towns can be. I know how difficult towns can be, um, you know, to, to find stuff and to dig through archives and to make requests. I'm just trying to, you know, figure out how, how we can quickly get the information out so we can all see, see the stuff and have some sort of transparency. You know, it's a big thing in the news lately, transparency. Well, let's get some. Let, let's see if we can, you know, make this information available to everyone and see what violations are happening, you know, in our local areas. Let's see if our community locally can see to make sure that things are happening that are supposed to happen. And if they're not, let's figure out why it's not happening and make it happen. So um, where, where can we see this stuff? That's my first question. I, I have three questions. You'd have so, to four. Uh, be, as far as uh, Fort Salonga, I mean, in the past, um, I had very good communication. I, I don't know if Keith is now the, the guy to contact, but um, I was constant communication with uh, Ryan Hild, uh, and uh, he would contact me every month or two and, uh, and say, hey, what's going on with this property? Is there anything going on? And, and I would tell him of any upcoming applications in, in, uh, in the area, especially Fort Salonga. Um, Keith, uh, you know, if you want to, you know, reach out to me, uh, if you're the new guy, uh, I've, I've been continuing to reach out to, uh, to Ryan uh, to keep him appraised of any uh, applications up that way. Um, actually, it was on my list of things to do tomorrow because uh, there are a few applications uh, coming up in Fort Salonga that he might want to be aware of. Um, hey, Peter, I'm going to put my email address in the chat box for you. Sure, it's uh, P. Hans, P. H. A. N. S at smithtownny.gov. Um, but yeah, just next week, uh, we have a preliminary hearing uh, before the planning board for the Owl Hill property. Um, I think the Jan is coming in with a new application in early February. Um, so, you know, these are things that in the past, I was always in communication with uh, Ryan on and I try to communicate that way. And then I know you, uh, the community has the, uh, the newsletter that goes out. Is there anything with the violations that we can see though? Like what summons have been issued? Um, no, uh, summonses are all issued by our uh, uh, public safety department. So as to what specific uh, properties have summonses or open well, up. Well, well, there was a lot of talk about, you know, what was issued or what wasn't issued or what, what they haven't done. And, and it seems that we didn't, you know, no one seems to know whether things are being enforced or not. So I'm just wondering how we, check you have to foil to see it. whether it's being enforced you have yeah, to foil it so there's i think um 
so there may be some some more information that were the the public safety department i think nicole said she was going to try and have um when she coordinates the the meeting with the supervisor right. is going to have somebody from the town attorney's office as well as the public safety department and um, there so i think a lot of these questions you can probably ask them um directly but if there are uh even if you have a, a number of parcels that um that you are interested in if you submit a foil request to the town attorney's office asking for all of the violations and follow up um, uh, pertaining to those violations on those sites, then what they will do is they will reach out to the public safety department, get the information that has been requested, and then we'll contact you once that information is compiled so that, um, so that it can be viewed. So, Seems pretty complex to just get something, you know, hey, in the last six months, what's been going on in the industrial park? It's not complex at all. So you, you could either get the form straight from the town attorney's office by calling them and they'll email you the forms or you could get the forms online on our website. It's not, it's not complex. I've done it myself in the past. Alex, what I, what I will work on for you while we're gonna put this meeting together with the town council planning, uh, not sorry, uh, public safety planning, um, DEW, and I believe the, uh, also the town attorney's office. I'll work on compiling records. Uh, so we'll have we'll have the information that you're looking for. That would be wonderful. I think the community would appreciate that. Okay. Um, my next question is about community outreach. Um, you know, I I don't doubt that it's difficult to get a hold of people. You know, I run a business and it's difficult to reach customers, so I get it. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, you did a uh, presentation and it says that about 20,000 people live in Kings Park. And I guess, I don't know, it sounded like a celebration that, you know, 6% of residents, if I'm mistaken, let me know, but 1,200 people responded out of 20,000. Um, so I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I feel like for a town um, that a little more effort should be made and... Uh, I think a continued effort to get more input. Um, I don't know if there's a, you know, industry standards out there of what something like this type of hundred year plan or 50 year plan should involve a certain percentage of the community in crafting this plan and, and making sure you get the uh, 25 or 30 or 50% feedback from that percentage of the community and, and, and keep on working until you get that, you know, uh, you know, if you could speak to that at all. Um, sure. So, um, you know, we had, we had conversations with, uh, with H2M, um, who's, who's our consultant, you know, regarding this, uh, a 6% response is actually a, a very good response um, for, for public outreach. I know that that's hard for people to, to accept. Um, I mean, you look at a presidential election that gets 30% or 40% of eligible voters, um, you know, responding. A, uh, the percentage that would have been considered acceptable is, is, is even is considerably lower. I mean, you look at something, you tend to get about a 1% response um, when, when you put out a questionnaire for, for a community. And so I really do think that the town did more, uh, in terms of outreach for this than, um, than we've seen a lot of the other communities do it. Every single civic association was directly emailed about it and asked to share with their membership, um, Every single school district was emailed and, and letters sent. Most of the school districts sent emails out to every single student in, in the district. Um, so there, there was considerable outreach. There was articles in Newsday. There were articles in the Smithtown News and the other local newspapers. So there was, I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of people on this call that, um, that were unaware of it. And I can appreciate that. I get it. I understand. You know, I just feel like there's got to be a better way. And I feel like 
you know, even even though you're saying six percent is a phenomenal, incredible, you know, achievement, that's just me. I I don't think it's good enough. You know, I think we can really just, need. To can I just interject a second? And can I just interject a second? And I, I apologize. This is Paul Musso, Allison. They, and I just want to say this in fairness to the town. These guys did. They had a hearing in every school district, every hamlet two years ago. Was anybody on the call at any one of those meetings? Anybody? Did anybody on this call go to any one of those meetings two years ago? Well, I'm sorry. Absolutely, any, yes. Well, so I, 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 I understand it, but, but, you, but you know, to sit here and, and, and berate them like this, these guys that work their tails off to get. No, I, I'm not berating them. I, I understand it's there. difficult. It's, you're, you're I'm just saying I don't accept you are berating them. I understand that, but they have worked their tails off to get to this point. And you see, I agree, and I, I, I 100% agree. Were you at the you know, meeting? I'm were not criticizing were you anybody. At any one of those meetings? Were you at any one of those meetings? Oh, I, if I knew about them, I would be there. Were you at the meeting? If I knew about it, I would have been there. That's why I'm here. I found out about this two nights ago. Hey, Alex, <laughs> um, just uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. First, if you know, if there is an outlet, a newspaper, or wherever you get your source of information, you know, we're happy to uh, include that if we're not already including it in a distribution list. I will say this. I will, you know, just I, I've come from the private sector. Um, and, and I'm in a public sector business. Un unfortunately, we really rarely hear, people rarely don't take interest in something like this unless they have a problem that directly impacts their, their at-home life. Their, their, and that's unfortunately a, a sad truth. Um, I get it. I understand. I appreciate it. I am not criticizing. That's why I was asking what the acceptance rates were. Um, I, I just... I still feel very strongly uh, that a lot of people, a lot more people should see it. Maybe some signs um, um, directing people to websites, you know, it's a page dedicated just for it, explaining, you know, in clear English. I don't know. That, I'm just trying to think outside the box here. Alex, can I ask you a question? Sure. So just give me your feedback on this because I'm, I'm trying to really wrap my head around this. We've done everything possible. We've had... We've had it on the back pages of every local newspaper. Actually, it's also been in Newsday. Um, it's been on social media. We've, uh, Nicole has made beautiful, beautiful uh, montage videos explaining everything. We have had these meetings that were promoted on social media, every social media outlet actually, including the newspapers. Anything that we could do without using taxpayer money no, I appreciate that. Thank I'd you for like know, just being for conscious. You, I use, you've mentioned it several times. So what do you think we could do in the future where you would get the message? Uh, I would say just, you know, including it with some mail that's already going to the residents, you know, like a tax bill or something. Yeah. A sponsored ad via zip code on Facebook. You, you know, I, I don't use Facebook that much, you know, and you know, say social media and, and, you know, people my age, I, you know, I think people under 50 don't read newspapers, you know, so sorry, I don't know. Yeah, respectfully, respectfully, I think it, a letter could have went out from the beginning and included in the tax bill. I mean, the, that would have killed two birds with one stone. You had to mail the tax bill I, anyway. I I have to, I don't I'm, I'm not trying to harp on this. I, if I could just get my last question out and, you know, I'm done. You know, I'm not criticizing anyone. You know, I really appreciate everyone putting in, you know, their effort. I understand it makes sense to update, you know, a new, uh, a, a, a new plan for the community. Um, I just think communities should be involved. Um, my last question, um, typically on this sort of plan, uh, what happens in the end? Does it get to a vote? Does the community get to vote on this? Or do our elected officials just run the shit through and no one knows about it? Um, well, I, I wouldn't characterize it as that. It is not put to a public referendum, um, if, that is, if that is the question. It is uh, voted on by the elected officials who you elect. Um, but it, 
it is voted on by the public officials. There are, like I said, there will be two public hearings before the public officials. So not just, you know, the staff people that that then, you know, give the information to the electeds, but there's will be at least two opportunities to um, to speak directly to all the members of the town board um, before they take their votes on on this. So and the only way to make comments and is and and to further the community involvement is just to email that email address and there's no other process or hearing or, or coming up. No, or, or... No, that's what that's what we were saying. There there are two public hearings um, that will be before the the board of that will be before the town board where you will be able. To, at this point, we're holding them virtually. Um, you know, if it uh, if the COVID situation gets gets better, then um, then they will be you know back to in person meetings, but um, but every member of the public is welcome to attend any town board meeting and to uh, just a general town board meeting. You could speak at the end of any of the town board meetings to the elected officials um, with regard to anything that's happening in the town. Uh, if you wanna speak directly about the comprehensive plan, you can address them at any of those meetings, but there will also be two dedicated public hearings um, for specifically for the draft plan and for the the final plan, um, once revisions are made to the draft, that you would be able to um, to to speak to the to the board. I just want to okay, say I got thank, it. thank you very much. I, I very much appreciate it. If uh, if I haven't conveyed it already, I'm very concerned about the light industrial to heavy industrial. I think a lot of people are. I don't think it makes sense to what you're saying. That's my comment. Not not questioning it. But thank you for all the work that you've put in. Thank you for your service and you know, uh, uh, having the community's uh, best interest in mind. And, uh, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trotter, one second. Nicole, can you just mention the town app that we have? Yes, so anybody who has a smartphone, uh, I would recommend if you just go to your app store, if it's uh, Apple or Google, either one, and search Town of Smithtown, you could download our town app. From there, you, you can pick and choose what you get notified about, but any, everything from uh, car accidents to uh, road work to, to meetings and events happening in the community are announced regularly. It's also a really great tool uh, to stay involved in, in what's going on in the community. Okay, I have to jump on another call. I just wanna point something out. I've listened to the next concert um, meeting I think there was three or four residents. So I congratulate Kings Park and Fort Salonga for being so involved. I, I really think there was like three or four uh, on the other one. So all these people are great and uh, thanks for doing it and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Okay, Paul Musso has had his hand up. Go ahead, Paul. I just wanted to say you guys did a phenomenal job getting this out to the public. You know, I understand that some people are upset, but the reality is that if you want to be involved, you're going to get involved. And it, and you do have the resources. The town has laid out resources. You guys spent a tremendous amount of time over the past two years laying this out. And I, I, I appreciate everything you guys have done. And I apologize, but I just, you know, you guys work tremendously hard to do what you do every day. And I just don't appreciate when people berate you like that. So hats off to every one of you guys. Um, in terms of the ZB, in terms of people questioning ZBAs, so I don't know if anybody from the town just wants to put pop their head on this. But when somebody makes an application to the town and they go before a ZBA hearing, is that open to the public or is that not open to the of public? Of course it is. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, but the ZBA stands for Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, okay. So would that yes, mean any, that so those those are public hearings. Uh, what will happen is anybody that is within 200 feet of the subject property will get a certified mail to uh, so that they are made aware of it. The property is posted um, with the date and time of the hearing, and then it's also in the local paper. But yes, it is. Um, it is a. It is always a public hearing. Um, yes. Okay. So the town no. does. So the town does do something to to let the, the local people within that area understand what's going on. 
You can also go to the town the website. And find uh, the meeples there. Right. So yeah. I guess my point is that, you know, people sat here and I guess berate you about it, but let everybody understand that the town does something. And if the question is, are you going to be involved or you're not going to be involved? So the fact that the town doesn't do anything on any particular hearing is not correct. I just wanted to put that out there. And again, you guys did a phenomenal job. And I, uh, I will say with Mr. Trotter, he's correct. This concert had about two or three people. Kings Park, amazing. You guys uh, did an amazing job getting it out there. God bless you all. Thank you. Nicole, there's a few people that um, that physically have their, their hands held. I see um, Karen, I see she's had- Karen's her had her hand up for a minute. I think, and then, um, I think Larry as well. Yeah, so if we can, uh, Karen and then Larry afterwards. Go ahead, uh, uh, Charles and Karen, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. It's uh, on your lower left-hand side. There's a little microphone. If you could just hit that button so you can speak. Yeah, I just had a question. I know I don't know how relevant this is to that, but it has to do with a lot of other things. What is the update on the 7-Eleven in Fort Salonga, which also has environmental impacts? And we've gone to meetings and we, we just, it doesn't, heard. we haven't heard anything back. We've signed up for information, but haven't gotten anything. Um, it's a pending application before the Board of Site Plan Review. Um, there was a variance hearing. Um, the Board of Zoning Appeals had, a, had granted variances um, for the site. Um, all commercial development is subject to approval from Board of Site Plan Review. It's still a pending application. The Board of Site Plan Review is also known as the, uh, well, it's the town board. The town board acts as the Board of Site Plan Review. So if it gets to the point where it's ready for an approval, it would have to go and be presented to the town board and uh, they would vote on the application. Um, it does not have uh, approval or building permits at this time. And Pete, I believe it was approved with conditions from the Board of Zoning Appeals, correct? Mm -hmm. I yeah. had to find out about that. We've been trying to follow it, but hadn't did we have to go on that Smithtown app? I'm honest, you call the planning department. That's uh, the simplest way. They don't post, um, um, there's really like no posting of all uh, decisions except in the town clerk's office. But normally people would just repeatedly, uh, you know, like once a month contact the planning department and uh, we um, give decisions. Uh, you know, we tell them the decisions. Yeah, because I thought there was supposed to be some kind of environmental study on that land because it is environmentally sensitive right behind there. I mean, snapping turtles will come out of there and they want to they want to build on that. I think you're probably, I think um, she's referring to the uh, the CEQA review that was completed for for the variance that the, um, I think the, when the board had, had closed the hearing or pending, pending CEQA, the environmental review. For that I, I believe that's what um, what you're you're probably referring to. Right. Uh, so they so pond. they approved that in a fresh pond back there to build on that. But you have to understand the property is already developed. It had been a bank building for years. Yeah, but they were supposed to leave the no, original footprint. Listen to listen to me, please. <laughs> the building that exists is being removed and replaced by a 7-Eleven the paving is actually coming towards 25A. There is no building that is going on anywhere behind what was already paved. That's what we were interested in, right? Okay, so they're not, is it gonna be parking back there or just what was there originally? There's the parking, there had been parking behind right. the bank building. Uh -huh. The parking, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, but I believe the parking or the paving is actually coming forward about maybe 10 feet. Yeah, there's a there's a decrease in impervious surface on that site. Okay, so it's not going to be any wider. It won't it won't be wider. It won't be deeper. It won't be closer to fresh ponds. Okay, all right. Okay, that's good. thank you. Sure. Okay, I have uh, Larry. I know you've been waiting. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, back to the downtown revitalization in Kings Park. Yeah, Plasky Road, to the best of my knowledge, has been zoned central business for ninety years. I don't think that zoning should change. You can give it that new designated name, but we do not need another neighborhood business classification in the downtown area. Keep it central business type zoning. It's been there for 90 years. It's been working. It's things are getting better. Thank you. Okay, so I have Kristen and I believe then we had John and Walter both had their hands up as well. So Kristen, go ahead. 
Uh, and then I'm going to call John and then Walter. Um, so I just wanted to find out which uh, Facebook, what's, what's the Facebook page that you posted on? Sure. The information on, about the meetings? Sure. So on, on Facebook, we are at Town of Smithtown. Um, there's also, uh, we're on Instagram as well, um, Town of Smithtown. The you wanna, page, go ahead, sorry. I'm sorry. On, on Town of Smithtown, though, the only um, the the only notice that I see about the master plan was posted four hours ago about that you can participate. And that yeah, was we four, we sent four a hours little... ago today. And then the only other one prior to that is December 18th, saying that the master plan is here. But that's all it says. So, so is there someplace else on Facebook that I'm not? Sure, seeing? sure. And Kristen, what I would recommend is, um, you know, if are, are you planning on attending the meeting about the um, heavy to light industry that we, we were talking about earlier with, with the town council and, and the other departments? I might. Okay. So what I can do for you, uh, what I'll do for, I'll just, I'll make a note of it. If you want, um, I'll put together a press packet that has all of the digital media regarding the master plan that's been done um, with, with the dates and everything. Um, and I'll also put together, um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, with, with all of the articles and all of the, we have copies of every kind of article, not article, advertisement we've done in a little press packet. So I'll put something together for you so you can, you can look at all the different posts on social media, um, you know, everything we did to publicize this, uh, we have it in a packet. I'll put it together and I can email it to you. Um, I mean, you, you could do that if you want. I, I was just, like I said, I get a lot of news from Facebook and I think a lot of us <clears throat> in our, in this age group get our news from, so, from Facebook. Um, but again, so I just wanted to know, is, is there a, the town of Smithtown that's is there any other place where you posted it? Because I'm not, I'm just not really seeing it on the town of Smithtown Facebook. Are you referring to the the, the announcement of the draft? Or I saw you... that on Dece December 18th there was an announcement that the plan is here, but the only link that people can participate was done four hours ago. No, that was a, a simple. We, what we we put out a little trailer essentially to to remind people to attend. Uh, we put out a press release, which if you click on the link should take you to the town's news, uh, the, the news portion of the town's website that details uh, the, it, the details information regarding the, the process. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I know we had a couple of different articles and coverage in the patch and stuff like that, that I'm happy to show, to share with you as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I knew about all this, but yeah, you know, but mostly through involvement with the Civic Association. Um, but like I said, I just, I think a lot of people get their news from Facebook. So um, it's a really good tool for getting, getting the word out there. That's all. Okay. Nicole, well, if you'd like, I just put my email address in the chat box. For anything from Fort Salonga, if you want to send it to me and I will make sure that it gets out to everybody. That would be great. great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay, did I think I had, um, was it John and then Walter? Uh, yes, uh, I'm John and Pagliazzo. Uh, thank you for having this meeting, it was very informative. Um, I have a question for Peter. Uh, you mentioned that next week uh, there's going to be some event uh, concerning Owl Hill. Uh, I live across the street from Owl Hill. I was wondering what is happening because uh, I don't know anything about it. Uh, yeah. Um, could you, could you elaborate for, don't take too sure. long, you know, half a minute. An application has been filed to the town of Smithtown for subdivision approval uh, on the property. Um, I believe it's uh, 18 uh, single family lots that are proposed on the property. And uh, next week, uh, which is Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, the 27th, um, there is a planning board hearing um, and um, it's the very first uh, hearing of numerous that would be required. Uh, this application uh, requires several variances, not only from the planning board, but from the Board of Zoning Appeals. So 
It's anticipated that they would be going to the Board of Zoning Appeals in February, but before they go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, um, they need to have a hearing before the, the, the planning board. There's no decisions. It's not anywhere near uh, ready for approval, um, but there is a public hearing uh, next Wednesday. All right, Peter, if I may, uh, the Force Along Association is gonna be asking for a continuance on that as there are too many things uh, being juggled around right now. Well, the official mail will be going out tomorrow. Okay, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on. <laughs> um, yeah, I have to disseminate a lot of what from uh, Ryan sent me this afternoon, so. Okay, yeah, like I said, I'm in, you know, a lot of conversation and communication with Ryan, so. Um, okay. It's right by his house, so I definitely keep him apprised. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and Keith, if you want to uh, contact me, it's unfortunate right. that's such a beautiful area of property. You know, it's I think the uh, the, the wealthiest uh, section of land in Fort Salonga. So, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I'll I'll, I'll work uh, through the Fort Salonga Association. Thank you for your time, Peter. Okay, John, 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 you, you, you said that I could send them the information. Or if I could just add something, uh, John. You should know that the uh, uh, the hour the Owl Hill. Uh, group has filed an application, a letter of interest application with the uh, with Suffolk County to sell that property uh, to the county for open space. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's uh, you know, right now money is tight. So uh, and because Smithtown doesn't have an open space program, uh, they may not uh, sit around and wait for money to become uh, become available on the county side to purchase that site. Okay. But they did they did fill out and file an application with the county to preserve it. Right. And from what I understand, an appraisal is in the process. Excuse me? An appraisal is in the process from my understanding. With the county? Correct. No, there's no money left uh, for an appra for appraisals. Okay. So no, that's not true. Uh, I, I wish it was, uh, but unfortunately it's not. Uh, the county is tapped out right now and there probably won't be money for appraisals until sometime the middle of this year, I believe. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, Walter, I'm gonna hit the ask to unmute button. There you go, go ahead. Hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Uh, two quick questions, really. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, someone indicated earlier that uh, there are no plans to widen Bread and Cheese Hollow Road, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Legislator Trotta said that. Okay. The second question is, are there any plans, proposals, discussions on building any kind of, uh, I'll call it a dump, uh, on, on Bread and Cheese or off Bread and Cheese Road north of Pulaski? None that I'm aware of. I don't, I can't think of anywhere in that residential area where a, uh, a dump could be proposed. Actually, I, I, if I'm thinking the same thing a dump is what we call a landfill and they're not even well, permitted on long island anymore or a garbage garbage fill or something trash fill nothing yeah like that. That, that's not even uh, permissible anymore on long island okay only because i saw something with a map sign and a dot that was very close to where i live um, which is off of bread and cheese north of pulaski so there's no plans of anything like that right no sir okay thank you Uh, I, I don't have anybody else's hand up. I don't know if anybody has anything else. Oh, I don't see. Oh, Kristen. Okay, Kristen, go ahead. <laughs> so um, I'm, in looking at the plan, I didn't see any zoning um, for the property that's, well, it's not in the plan. And I'm just asking, I don't think there'll be any changes, but, or, or well, maybe you could just tell me the property up behind um, the the um, it's it's the Correa property mm -hmm. up behind the what is it the duck or chicken place Raleigh's up behind Raleigh's is that what is that zoned as and what will it be zoned as in the the master plan? So there, um, Correa actually has um, has two. There's two. There's two spots in that area that we um, 
refer to as Korea. I'm going to just pull up the map so that I can um, I can show it. Um, the part they own a property that is immediately south of the of the Raleigh um, farm or the mm -hmm. farm. Um, I don't know if that's the area that you're referring to, or if you're referring to the the very large wooded um, area that's that's south of the DEC um, land. Uh, Both, if you have it, I just don't see it in the master plan here. Sure. Yeah, it's um, it's actually on the same. So I'll pull up the I'll pull up the page. Um, Because that's a new zoning that's over off of Old Northport, right? That kind of clustered zoning that you do have in the plan? So Correa, so I'll just point out here. So this area, can you all see my cursor um, moving? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, this is Raleigh Farm. This is the, um, the chicken farm right here. Okay. Okay. Um, and Correa owns, uh, there's this piece right below it. And if I can get an aerial, I'll, that, that might be more helpful too, but just so that I can at least have a map up. So um, Korea owns this piece, which is just south of, of the chicken farm. Um, but the other area is this entire area here, uh, we refer to as the Korea property. This is all, um, this is all wooded. You can see it, if you can see my cursor moving over to the left side of the page, that's this, um, that's this whole area over here. Um, the, the recommendation of the plan is that the entire area, so right now the entire area is zoned for half acre uh, single family residential units with the exception of uh, the very Southern part um, at the corner of Lawrence and Old Northport Road. This is zoned light industrial right now. So the recommendation is to, is to zone the entire area for uh, medium density uh, uh, development, which would be somewhere in a, a third acre, you know, somewhere between quarter acre to half acre um, uh, density, um, but to cluster that development, meaning that you may have properties, um, let's say it's zoned, let's say it, it gets zoned for, um, for half acre uh, uh, zoning, if we call that medium density or third acre. Um, in order to preserve the undeveloped portions of the property, so our, uh, our goal would be to preserve this, um, this large undeveloped uh, part that we call Korea so that it could be combined with the DEC land. So this, where my cursor is right now, is owned by the DEC. And just to the north, where you see my cursor here, is, um, is Suffolk County Parkland. So, uh, so the intention would be to cluster development in the, in the southern, uh, more southern part of the, uh, of the area and to be able to preserve the undeveloped space. Now clustering would mean that you'd have, you wouldn't necessarily have half acre lots, you may have quarter acre um, lots, but that's because you're taking the, uh, what could have been developed in the, the northern part and consolidating it into a smaller area. So Korea owns that northern part and the southern part there, so what you're trying to say Korea, to no, Korea is... The, Korea owns all of this here and this piece over here. So basically you're saying let let him develop on that smaller piece, but keep that bigger piece piece to the north open. Keep the big uh, keep the bigger piece to the north. And it, and it may not even be be him that um that would end up developing. And this is one of those areas that would require a lot of coordination between multiple property owners. Um, this entire area here is owned by Jeswali. Um, that's that's what you see. That's what you see over on the, the left hand side. Um, and your proposal is to keep that light industry? No. No. Um, would be oh, to the whole the whole area medium yeah. density. That's right. 
That's right. So, um, and, and would involve in order to, you know, to do that, it would involve uh, remediation of, of this, uh, of this property as much of it had been, um, had been mined and, and filled. So. Right. And there was, I, I'm, I'm mildly familiar with all that. Um, so, hmm. yeah, let me think about this one. But uh, so just where, where would you allow, the, the map is very unclear about where exactly you would allow the medium, you know, medium density cluster. And I get where you're saying in the north where Correa, uh, that property could be preserved. But are you talking about medium density in the whole, the rest of the area? The whole, what is it, Jeswali? Right, so so it would be to zone the the entire area for um, for a medium density residential. So the, most of this, even most of Jiswali, is actually zoned half acre residential. Believe it or not, um, currently. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said it was light industry. The the very the very um, there are a few parts that. It, Jiswali owns something like twenty or thirty uh, tax lots. There's there's a, a lot of a lot of tax lots. Um, there are a few of them that are zoned currently zoned light industry. Um, maybe uh, I don't know if everybody is interested in it or if I can um, you know, but I can certainly share the information either directly with you offline and and get you um, the current zoning map and show you know the overlay. Of, um, of what would be changed you know, from light industry to uh, to a single family. Well, I mean, I think that should be in the plan, no? Well, it is in the plan, mm -hmm. yes. In detail? The, yes, I mean, the existing zoning is is in the plan and um, and the proposed is, is in the plan, so. Um, I'm sorry, I just, how many houses are being proposed there? I know it's like a big zone. So is there, I think what she's asking is specifically how many houses are gonna be put here? Sure, so so first of all, no houses are actually being proposed right now. This is, you know, but it, it is a, a plan that would allow for, for development proposals to come in. Right, a plan that would allow for how many houses specifically? Underst I understand. Um, there are approximately, this area is approximately 100 acres. So if you're looking at a medium density um, on 100 acres, so somewhere between a third of an acre to a half of an acre um, per, per property, uh, even if we go with, with the third of an acre, then you're looking at 300 uh, potential homes. Yeah. Wow, um, and that's, uh, that's with and that's homes. with with the that's with the the um, preserved Korea portion, north portion, north side. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean that could also be in the form of let's say condominiums. I mean you might get a, a section um, where let's say it's I don't know the uh, the the corner of the property, uh, and somebody comes in with a condominium proposal, and there's a hundred condos that would be one third of uh, the yield of that entire area. And um, I think it, as uh, Allison was saying, the, the idea is to try to uh, uh, cluster as much as possible. Even the uh, subdivision just to the south in Comac, I don't know if you can really see, but if you look closely at the map, um, the, um, all the lots are uh, smaller and there's a green belt that surrounds the entire uh, subdivision of both country estates and country woods. That's basically what a, uh, a cluster development is. It's the same concept for over here. You might have a, a condo proposal for, let's say, um, she said it's about 100 acres, maybe on 20 acres. Well, that's going to eat up a big chunk of uh, the overall yield of that property. And um, we see that as the best way to try to preserve as much land as possible. We can certainly discuss it a little bit more further, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, contact the office. I don't know that. Right. And and again, you know what 
the what the environmental review has to look at is what could be built under the existing conditions versus what could be built if the plan was was adopted so the like we had said the majority of of this is zoned for half acre um, is zoned for half acre residential so if you have even I'll say you know 80 acres that were zoned for half acre residential and only you know 20 for light industry um, then you're looking at 160 homes that would have been permitted, you know, as of right. And I mean, don't quote me on the numbers because I don't have all the the uh, the acreage right in front of me, you know. But um, but I do think it's important to look at what would be permissible uh, without adopting the plan, and and what kind of um, of increase or or change um, adopting the plan would would generate. Allison, how much of that property is in the Kings Park School District and how much is in, in Comac? Um, I don't have the school district boundaries um, no, on on yeah. these maps. Uh, Pete, do you know offhand? Otherwise, we can try yeah. to get that information. I, I would say about two thirds of the land is in uh, Kings Park School District with the southern one third in the Smithdown School District. There's uh, that paper street that comes across. Um, with the three right. lots here, right about where your cursor right. is. And it goes nor um, east to west across uh, roughly where your cursor is. Oh, okay. Got it. I mean, if, if, they, if they're proposing 300 homes, and Allison, you know, you know, we did a study several years ago that, uh, that, sh that determined uh, every, for every single family home that's built it puts the school district in the red uh, on average about six thousand dollars. Mike, what we're anticipating, I mean, we, we keep saying homes. Yeah, I guess we should probably be talking more in the terms of units. Right. Because um, if you get condominium developments, they tend to be a very low generator of uh, school children to the districts. Right. OK. Thanks, Pete. Uh, okay, uh, John has his hand up. Go ahead, John. Uh, uh, yes, uh, earlier uh, Keith mentioned uh, twice, in fact, that there's a terrible smell where he lives, which is near Pulaski Road. Where is this smell coming from? Is it from the, um, the plant that's there or is it from the industry that's there? And uh, why aren't the towns, Huntington and Smithtown, trying to uh, minimize the environmental impact of these industries. <sighs> is there any, is there th anything being done? Uh, or do they just burn what they want to burn and they don't care about the, the pollution? Well, that and John, I've even complained to the EPA and absolutely nothing has been done about it. So this goes on forever that uh, they just, Depending which way the wind's blowing, you could smell it down in Brentwood on the Sunken Meadow Parkway while you're driving. People don't realize what they're smelling, but it's the same exact smell that you smell right here when the wind's blowing the other way. And, you know, during the summertime, we pr get predominantly southerly breezes, and it's almost impossible to be outside sometimes. So I guess my question is, should, the, should, should not the master plan have an element in it, a component in it about environmental protection, including smell? Um, I mean, there are many sophisticated things, engineering things that go on around the world where you get almost no smell. Including filtration. Yeah. yeah so, so why is this part of the, I guess my question is, is, is this environmental uh, odor pollution uh, part of the master plan and if so, not so odor is, is certainly um, is certainly an aspect that has to be reviewed in any environmental impact statement um, this is a what would be done for the comprehensive plan is a generic environmental impact statement because there are no specific proposals so it has to look at what what the potential um, what the potential generating impacts could be Howard. Can you um, can you expand upon uh, what the what would be reviewed with respect to odor in the generic um, versus how it would be reviewed um, for any uh, specific proposal that came forward? 
I can as soon as I find my cursor. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, yes, the odor air quality is a factor to be considered in the generic environmental impact statement. So as Allison said, we don't have any specific proposals. So we'd certainly be looking at existing conditions um, in the area. If anything was to come in in the future, uh, be it uh, organic waste, um, windrows of uh, grass clippings, which I'm going to tell you is not allowed in Smithtown. DEC does not allow that, but it is an, an odor generator. So it's an example of that. If, it, if anything came in that was to, had the potential to be an odor generator, then that would be looked at further, whether it was just an environmental assessment or a full environmental impact statement. But odor would certainly be looked at at the time we got any specific proposal. So will the master plan ensure that, I'll, I'll go all the way, it, that the plan will have odor, totally odorless in X years, let's say 15 years or something like that? Right, so the plan, the plan is not going, the plan does not address um, the, uh, um, the plan is a, is a land use, is a land use plan. Uh, not in not an operational a business operations um, plan. So uh, there are other aspects of the town code that that can address business operations. Zoning zoning is not allowed. Zoning cannot address the operations um, of, uh, of specific of specific businesses. We can say where they're allowed to be. Um, we can say uh, when they are allowed to, you know, hours that they are allowed to operate. But um, but in terms of best management practices, uh, I think that comes in more with with other um, parts of the code. And so uh, so the comp plan, the comprehensive plan, does not say that uh, you know X um, you know industry you know would have to install filters on. Um, you know, on, on their plans. Um, I mean, that, I think that really gets into to DEC and EPA uh, regulations. Howard, am I? Uh, You're right, it's DEC and uh, to some extent Suffolk County Health potentially. Uh, EPA typically does not dial down uh, to this level. DEC is your best contact. New York State DEC over in Stony Brook. Well, I, I really think uh, the master plan should have this in it in some way. I, I don't know the details, um, if that could be done. I know in different countries, they do this. There's no odor. <laughs> I mean, they'll have, I lived in Sweden and it was never, never anything, any problem. No. I mean, people's health are, is affected by, by this. I don't know what the long-term effect of um, this here is, but uh, it seems like it's something that should be in the master plan. I don't, I don't know the answer to it, but it should be in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you. We will, uh, I'll, I will be conversing with the environmental department and, and our consultant to see um, what, uh, what the best way for us to incorporate, um, to incorporate that concept. Uh, Thank you very much. Recommendations, thanks. Okay, so I have uh, Teresa was, was waiting. Yes, thank you. I wanted to, um, to add to something that John said, because as you listen to the gentleman who has this horrible odor outside his home, you know, typically, when some of these things go through and there is a negative impact, maybe even unforeseen, the remedy is always up to the homeowner and it could be exorbitant in, in fees. And so maybe part of the master plan is that it include the remedy for unforeseen and it not be on the, the homeowner's burden or resident's burden, but on government's burden. to rectify it for the homeowners. Cause you know, as, as I sit here and I listen to an 8,000 square foot monstrosity behind someone's home, 
and a stench that they can't come out of is these are all of the things that unremedied make people hesitant to change. And then with the code enforcement, you say, well, maybe wouldn't we wouldn't need so many changes. And I get it for revenue if we're missing funds that should come in from enforcement. And at what point does it affect our, our property taxes? I mean, our property values. I'm sorry. I, I don't think anybody else was talking. It was just somebody, I'm gonna mute somebody. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. And then at what point does this affect the values of our property? And then ultimately, again, the revenue for the town. I mean, I'm all for town revenue but it just seems like we're moving, that, that we should be getting funds through avenues that already exist and negatively impacting um, our community in ways that's gonna cost us in the long run. So I'm hoping that maybe moving forward when, whether it's the EPA or the DEC and they allow these things to go through, that the remedy be on government and not on the residents impacted by it. And that be included in the master plan. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Keith, I, I know you have your hand up, go ahead. Okay, one thing that I have not heard discussed this evening is the um, environmental plume that is under the uh, south end of Fort Salongo coming from that industrial area. And that is only increasing. If you allow heavier industry to go in there, that plume is just going to get worse and worse. And I don't remember who it was that mentioned about the rate of cancers in Fort Salonga. It is ridiculous. We're losing our families because of this environmental catastrophe, for lack of better words. And if it doesn't get checked, we will end up with a Grumman style situation like they have in Bethpage. Not that it's a town issue necessarily, but I'm just curious if anyone knows if there are any um, cluster maps um, with uh, you know Kings Park uh, specifically to know whether we're above or below the cancer rate, because I do think that it's important to address that. I think taking the planning of the next 50 years into account and to realize whether we are above or below. And if we are above, I mean, that just screams to me, you know, stop, put the brakes on, let's figure out what's going wrong here because, you know, there's issues that need to be resolved. And, uh, you know, I don't know if anything exists currently. It was very difficult to find that information when I briefly looked. There's general maps on all of Long Island and different counties, but not necessarily Kings Park specifically. And I don't know whether that uh, the government's just not compiling it or not displaying this to us, or maybe you and uh, uh, Smithtown have access to different things, you know, in the town that maybe us, uh, you know, residents don't necessarily have the access to see. Yeah, I mean, it might be more, um, it might be more Suffolk County Health. Um, the town doesn't have a, a health department. Um, it would be Suffolk County Health Department. Um, I would think that that's probably the the best resource I can speak. Um, I can speak with our consultants in doing the the environmental impact um, to to see what is what's available in that respect. The residents would very much appreciate you looking into that. Thank you very much. Okay, Alison, I'm going to speak a little out of turn here, if I may, but I think you folks want to go home. You've had a very busy evening, and I'm sure you want to get to work tomorrow morning, bright eyed and bushy tailed. <laughs> So I just, from the residents of Fort Salonga, I want to say thank you very much for what you've put in tonight and for putting in for the master plan. Uh, I know you've kind of been beaten up tonight, uh, some more than others, but uh, thank you very much from Fort Salonga. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for giving us your email too. Um, I've added you to our distribution list. So for any uh, news updates, you'll get those as well for the community. And we really appreciate you getting uh, getting your community together tonight too. Great, thank you, Nicole. It looks like Kristen, do you have, I think Kristen has her hand up. Um, 
Yeah, um, I agree. Absolutely. You, you guys are doing a great job. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated. I just wanted to on the record that I really appreciated that this plan took into consideration things like placemaking and, um, you know, improving Main Street, uh, the streetscape. Um, and, you know, I, I'd love to see a commitment to more trees in the downtown area, large trees. And, uh, and also that the plan took into consideration, you know, developing guidance for facade treatments uh, for development, developers to, to follow. You know, Kings Park is a very special little hamlet. We're in a very scenic part of the island. And I think we all appreciate that, those of us that live here. And, you know, just want to see, see this done right. And it looks like the plan that, that you're working with, you know, really takes into consideration, you know, making it a special place, not just a you know, overdeveloped place. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, okay, so I, 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 I don't see anybody else with any other questions. If, if, if something comes up at any point, again, um, I'll, I'll add the email address one more time in the chat in case anybody um, needs it. Uh, but again, if something does come up and you wanna ask it, uh, feel free to email Smithtown planning at smithtownny.gov. Um, again, that's, I'm going to type it while I'm saying it. <laughs> Smithtown planning at smithtownny.gov. And, um, feel, and also, you know, uh, while the Hamlet presentations for Smithtown and St. James are, uh, are coming up next week, they're not necessarily related, um, but you're more than welcome to attend those. Um, if you want to see what's going on in the other hamlets and we will have this up on YouTube. It'll probably take about 24 hours, uh, but hopefully it'll get up tomorrow. And if you want to put it on your social media pages or share it with your, with your neighbors in any way, um, the channel again is Smithtown GTV on YouTube, uh, and, and feel free to, to encourage them to, uh, to ask questions and give input as well. And uh, thank you again for, for being with us tonight. And we thank you for all of your input. Right, Nicole, just real quick. I went to that GTV site this evening to try and access the COMAC uh, meeting from last week. Uh -huh. And I could not find that on there. I saw the uh, Nesconset and Hot Pog, but not the COMAC. So if you could please double check on that. Yeah, and I know the COMAC one, it's also, um, I'll let people know, we will be posting updates to anything uh, pertaining to the plan on, um, I can, I don't know if I can type it in here. Uh, we have a, a link on the planning department's page. So if you go to smithtownny.gov and you go to the, uh, to the planning department's page, there's a link for the draft comprehensive plan. Um, all updates with respect to the plan will be posted on that. And the links for, for each of the meetings that have already occurred are are on there. I I checked them all, so I know that um, I know that each of them are are working. So that's another resource, Keith. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I also included the link here. Um, if you I, want, I, it's, you. Yeah. it's easy enough for you to click on. Uh, it it's pr it's probably because they uploaded a, a business spotlight in between the other two, so it might not be in order. I uh, see. Have to re so, sorry, but yeah, so the, the, um, if you, if you um, have trouble looking for it again, like Allison said, the comprehensive master plan, there's a button right on the homepage that, that uh, it's right underneath. It says citizen help center right on your homepage. You can click that and then all the links are there as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much.